Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Mountainside Podcast. Our guest for this episode is my friend Baker Levitt from Black Rifle Coffee Company. Baker had a mule deer hunt in Nebraska and was able to carve out a little bit of time to fly in a day early from Florida, sit down, and record this episode with us where we talked about a lot of different shit, including some of his hunting experiences and what he does at Black Rifle. I thoroughly enjoyed having Baker in studio. I've known him for some time now, and I enjoyed our conversation. It's important. How, how, how's, how's, uh, oh, you up in the mountains? Fun. Dude, it was hard to come out, honestly. Really? Yeah. I came out this week. <laughs> now it's on me. I gotta, I gotta perform. Are we recording? Jeremy, are you good? I'm good. Baker Levitt. Cheers, man. Happy to be here. Yeah, man. I'm I'm stoked to have you, man. It's really nice to have you in studio. We've known each other for a minute. And, yeah, we've uh, been texting and talking back and forth for yeah. probably eight months now. Yeah, it's crazy. Yeah. Well, so you're in from Florida, first yeah. off, and what are you doing in Colorado? So I recently started a new position at Black Rifle Coffee, so I am now the community manager. for. I'm the hunting community manager. So if, if anyone wants to know what that is, Sloan Brown, who works for Yeti, I have the same job Sloan has, but for Black Rifle. So I've been consulting for Black Rifle for since the beginning, you know, and they're like, I've, I've been, have been helping them push the boulder up the mountain for seven years now. Um, and there never really was a, uh, like the, the things that I'm super knowledgeable about, like weren't primary focuses for the company at the time. So the th I would say the things that I know the most about is fitness and hunting okay and i started planting seeds i wish i knew more about that stuff <laughs> it's well i just i have just I, I, I know i yeah. have like with the, with regards to the fitness thing like i have some like epically like just phenomenal friends who have a knowledge base that would blow your mind and i just listen to what they say so i've learned a lot but um the things that i know the most about are probably hunt with regards to black rifle coffee are hunting and fitness and I started planting seeds four years ago. I bought Evan Hafer and Matt Best and Logan Stark. I bought them their first bows. That's awesome. Because I, w I watched, and this is, <clears throat> I met Sloan. This is when Sloan was at Peterson's before. I th no, what was he? No, uh, maybe, I think he was at Backbone Media. So Sloan, before he came to Yeti to take Ben O'Brien's job, he worked for a company called Backbone Media. Uh, and forgive me, Sloan, if I got that correct, but I'm pretty sure that's what it is. And they helped produce a film called Place of Peace. It's about a special forces guy named Bobby Farmer, who was in third group. Um, saw a lot of crazy stuff over there, a lot of high-speed stuff, a lot of explosions and PTSD and all this stuff. And they did this film called Place of Peace. And he had, he was sitting at his kitchen table, um, and he had a pistol in his mouth. He was going to kill himself. Oh, and I, and as I recall, he needed to, he walked out to the garage to do, like, turn off a light or something. And he saw an old bow. And he picked that bow up. It was one arrow. He grabbed that bow with that one arrow and shot it. Hit the target. Walked. Pulled the arrow out. Walked back. Shot the target again. And didn't kill himself. All right. So um, that film, it, and, and for those of you listening, it's Place of Peace. And I highly recommend you watching it. And I saw that, and it just really moved me. I was like, oh, my God, like, like uh, therapy 20 paces at a time. That's yeah. epic. It's epic. And it the does film, so much for yeah, me, man. Yeah, uh, it's, Hands down. Like, that, that is my meditation, I guess, every the, day. And the thing about it is, like, when you're shooting a bow, you can't really daydream. A rifle, you can daydream. But a bow, you got to keep your arm extended, your, other, your shoulders pinched back, and, like, you're checking your bubble and your sight picture. And there's oh, just so many things going on, you can't just daydream. Yeah. And so I saw that, and I was like... I'm going to get Evan and Matt and Logan bows. I want them shooting. Not because they had PTSD or they had anything going on with them, but it's just like they, they need to, because this is cool shit. These guys need to be doing this. So I got them, I bought them with money out of my own pocket. I didn't, I didn't get a hookup. I didn't call in a favor. And, um, uh, and then, you know, they just started shooting and getting into it. And then they started getting into hunting and I took Logan hunting a few times and all of this was done on purpose. Like, um, and, making introductions and you know bringing people on board like john dudley and andy stump because so uh kilcliffe uh, another company th that i'm involved with i helped start that company um dudley and andy were influencers for kilcliffe and then right about then it's like yeah these guys need to be working with black rifle for sure so I, they migrated over there as well still still work with kilcliffe but 
introduced him to them. Dudley got Dudley really got him into shooting. What Taught, a badass, yeah. man. That guy is a stud when it comes to the archery world. And that's man. one of the things about Dudley that I think I think Dudley, honestly, in my opinion, is as good as anyone in the world at introducing new people to archery. Do I think Dudley's going to take a season pro and make him a better archer? No, I don't. Do I think that John Dudley can get a guy that's interested in, in bow hunting, successful and shooting and knowing the basics and the mechanics and getting good and being successful? Absolutely, as well as anybody in the world. The dude puts out tons of information that's phenomenal. And so they met Dudley, and then they just all got hooked. And then as the company matured and the you know our, our primary verticals and things we focus on, which is vet, veterans initiatives, things like that, making the best coffee out there, we hit those goals and we continue to, to raise the bar, but it's like, we need to move into some other spaces. Yep. Hunting is one of them. And I remember having the conversation with Evan and Logan and like, I don't, I'm, I, I, I'm not a claimer. I don't take credit for much of anything. I really don't. Um, but I think you'll be hard pressed to find a more supportive teammate than me. It's like, if you're in a situation and, what you really, you need someone to get your back, like um, to say, hey man, I, I, I'm with you here. I'm gonna help you push this boulder up the hill. And it was time to go into hunting, and that's when I said, hey guys, I've earned the right to 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 succeed or fail at this. And Evan was like, no, you're right. He's like, if anyone has, it's you. And so that's a long answer to your <laughs> question. So I uh, am going hunting in Curtis, Nebraska tomorrow, and. One of the things I wanted to do was expand Black Rifle in the hunting space. So, all right, what's the closest airport to Curtis? So, there's a Denver's like four hours. So, it's like, well, if I fly into Denver on a Sunday, I can probably record two to three podcasts. Yeah. I can swing by two bow shops. Oh, right. uh, yeah. What bow shops are you going to? Um, sh- RMS. A fucking awesome guys. And then, and then what's the, what's the other big one? Um, no Limits. No Limits. Yep. I went by both both those, great bow yeah. shops, man. They're outstanding. So, so. Swung by both of those today. Going to record with you, and then I'm recording with Luke for Gladiators Unleashed yeah. afterwards. Um, driving to Curtis, Nebraska tomorrow. Going to hunt mule deer, and then we're doing a we're launching a program called the Lodge Program, where we are we basically picked uh, you know two dozen of the top waterfowl um, lodges in the country, and we're supporting them with black rifle, uh, providing them coffee, swag, all that stuff, drink and everything. So. Um, after I hunt, I'm going to scoot down to, well, I'm going to go over to River Lodge, which is in uh, Overton, Nebraska, and then I'm going to swing down um, to Habitat Flats and um, Hurt Locker. Nice. Um, and then I'll come back to Denver, record a podcast, Kafaro cast, and then I'll head back home. Yeah, it's kind of cool that we're all kind of right in this little mountain community. We're all thirty minutes yeah. from each other. You well, know, it's like is, it's like Bozeman. Yeah, like if you were a camo company or a pack company, yeah. you could drop a J dam on Bozeman and take out your competition. Oh, I know. Yeah, you know? <laughs> you like, really could. Like Aaron at Kafaro, there, if they wanted to get rid of Stone Glacier, they could just yeah, they're calling an airstrike over there and knock it all out. But, so that's the thing. So I don't believe in getting one bite of the apple, going one place sure. and doing one thing. That's just not. I just to me that's wasted opportunity. So I came out early, and I'll stay a day late, and I'll accomplish a ton. That's great. I'm happy you're here, man. On one trip. Yeah. yeah. Michael Michael Shea, who's the editor in chief of Free Range American, is uh, a couple hours from here. Oh, really? And he just shot his first uh, elk today. Awesome. Yeah. I just came out of elk camp this morning, actually. Yeah. So. And you said your brother got a five by five with the first with his bow. There's a uh, Brian Broderick who owns a company called Day Six Arrows. All right, day six mm-hmm. gear. Um, he is, uh, in my opinion, one of the most accomplished woodsmen, outdoorsmen, watermen that I know. Tarpon on a fly, billfish on a fly, inshore on a fly, trad bow, compound bow, rifle, all over the world. He has done it all. He has, on his wall, he has some monstrous elk. He's, I think he's probably shot 40. Yeah. He's, he's probably shot 40. Pope and Young deer, Damn. whitetail, yeah. and and like half of them were with a trad bow, really, and jeans and a flannel That's shirt. That's a whole other level for people that don't that aren't into archery. Yeah. Traditional is like you might as well be hunting with a spear, in my uh, opinion. Yeah. I asked yeah. Dudley, I was like, "Why don't you ever shoot trad or anything?" He goes, "He he said he shot he he shot an arrow one time out of it, 
and had no idea what happened and said that's enough. He said he didn't. He was like, I don't know what just happened. I'm done. I'm not interested in this. Right. But um, Broderick, my first uh, elk hunt was six years ago in Utah, over the counter, public land, do it yourself. No clue what I was doing. And he said, I'm going to give you a piece of advice. And I said, What's that? He said, I hunt broadside elk. And I said, What are you talking about? He goes, I shoot the first broadside bull that comes into my range. And I was like, You're full of shit, man. Like, you have. A dozen 325, 350, 375 inch bulls on your wall. He goes, You haven't seen the other, the smaller ones I shot. He goes, I shoot broads. He goes, Go in there with the mindset of you're hunting broadside elk. Yeah. And I was like, All right, I can do that. Yeah. So that's my thing with elk, man. Like, um, they are so smart and they'll range too. Like, they'll come in to 70 yards. Like, oh, yeah. we've, they know. We had multiple times where we had bulls in in the last couple of days and they were at 70, 80 yards. But they won't come any closer. You no, know? So for yeah. me, like they're like sixty. They're like, yeah, this he, he's not shooting yeah. past fifty. <laughs> for me, I had we're a forty good. yard limit this year because really? I've been so busy with the podcast and this is this where is, we were hunting. You couldn't shoot much really? further than that. It was dark, deep holes. You know? it was just, yeah. This is this is the most I've shot preseason in my life. Yeah, like I, fifty to hundred arrows a day for the past month. That's great. Just man. over burn through two two D loops. Yeah, because I have a little burr on my on my release. And I refuse to file it down because I don't want to mess with it. And yeah, so, I'm like that. Well, if if it works, why change? I'm on it? my third D loop <laughs> right now this summer. Yeah, but um, so yeah, I've got a elk hunt in at the Hall Ranch in Col- Southern Colorado, um, into September. Awesome. Which is rifle and yeah, all, all the elk I've ever shot were with a bow. But this one, this place has really really big elk. I'm going with Eastman's for off the grid TV, and so. They're like, yeah, it's rifle. And I was like, you know what, man? Like, if I got to pull out a rifle. What a great to get, opportunity, to get like man. a monster 350, 375. I was like, yeah. Yeah, I'm going to do it. Yeah. So Dudley shot uh, a monstrous bull elk like two days ago. Like, oh, really? Um, I haven't, I've been in the backcountry, so I haven't paid attention to any of it. That's my one excuse every year just to like throw this in the backpack. Yeah. I think I texted you from satellite yeah. yesterday yeah. and my wife, and, and that was it, bro. Like, So he, he got a monster, which got me super fired up. And then Logan left Big Chino, where he was mule deer hunting yesterday, and drove from Arizona to Deseret in Utah, got there last night, and then put a whopper six by six on the ground really this morning. yeah he, i was like oh, uh, yeah. uh, texting last night i was like when do you start elk hunting he goes tomorrow he's like yeah. i was like what he's like yeah he's like i'm on the road right now pulling in tonight and then this morning it dude it must have been 10 a.m man it got hot the last couple of days the first couple of days it rained it's too hot right now yeah. man it is it's brutal for colorado anyways really? this time of year well yeah. there's a there's a heat wave i think on, yeah out here out west um but like that's the thing where i live in florida man like there it is Look at that thing. I mean, God seriously. Damn. Look at that whale's tail. Look at the whale's that tail. That is fucking an epic elk, man. That's a six Congrats. by six. Look at the look at the look at the royals. Look at the swords on that yeah, thing. The, the fours. That's I mean Dallas Haymeyer took those photos. Wow. Dallas home Dallas Haymeyer is such a good photographer. He's so good. Does he work for Black Rifle full time or is he Um I, no, I, I don't think you – no, know, I think he's a 1099 for us. Like, I think okay. he's a contractor. So, like, he's he's always doing and filming something. There's There he is right there. That's him walking. I mean, look, look at that at thing. That. Jesus. Where was this at? I think that was in Montana, man. Okay. I, but th- n- There's no, some re- – No, no, no. That's, uh, no, that's Deseret. That's at Utah. That's in Utah. Yeah. Uh, but, hey, I could be wrong. I'm pretty sure that's man, Deseret. some of those bulls, like when we had Dana Monroe in, she was showing us the spider bull out of like Monroe, Utah, where she's yeah. from. And this thing, it's just like, I, it must have had 12 points on one side. I swear to God. So It was it, non-typical, it, it, just gnarly it, looking thing. If you want to see big bulls, there's a guy by the name of Ryan Carter. All right? So uh, it's, I think it's, uh, look up Ryan Carter, DC Outfitters. I think that's Ryan Carter, DC Outfitters, something like that. Um, he has like, as a guide, like the world record elk, which is like four twenty five or something. Damn, is that Ryan? Yep, that's him. Uh, so he does governor. Let's tags. Let's give Ryan a follow, Jeremy, if you're on the mountainside one. Yeah, yeah, I got it. Yeah, so Ryan does governor tags for some very well known famous people. Um, like just absolutely. Let me look at. Oh these my god, man, that is insane. Look at that. I like. I don't. So I don't. I don't. Des- I don't know. 
I'm not, not ready. For, I'm not ready for that. Yeah. I'm not ready for that. I yeah. haven't earned that. Like, could I pay a, oh cut God. a check to go shoot <laughs> yeah. something like that? Yeah, no, but I'm not going to. Right. Physically, yeah. I mean, I, I just That's I, insane. It and truly I, is. Man, I thought we had big elk running around here. You ought to see the golf course up here. I mean, we got seven by eight bulls that come in opening day of archery season. No, no, Colorado's. Stuff, yeah. I, if I'm not, but they're not like that. I, I, I think, I think the the whoppers are like right now are like Arizona and New Mexico. I think yeah. those are the biggest. Utah and Colorado have them too. Those are like your four top states. Forgive me if I'm. Yep. I, I, you know, if I if I get that wrong, but like no, I think you're he's, right on all so that. since he does the governor tags, like he has people constantly like his understanding of elk is from coast to coast. Like there's a 400 inch bull in like Oklahoma. Really? Oh yeah, dude. So like people reach out to him constantly. Is it on a ranch or is it no. free range? Free, I, I think it's yeah. free range. I don't, maybe I don't, I don't know. I don't, I don't know. know if you but, even classified as free range. But. but he he gets like like he, he'll go he'll go in and look at that bulls for his clients and stuff wow and um like but his the thing that's super impressive aside from like just some of the elk he posts photos of is like his knowledge of the species and it's not just knowledge of the animal it's the the geographic knowledge of the animal as well like so for example um we were talking about colorado he's like you know colorado had really good rain this year so incredible rain. yeah, yeah. so you're gonna have super healthy bulls yep. you know and and one thing i learned last september at big chino was um my one of my best friends jamie shira shot a hammer 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 of a uh, a muley buck out there and uh jp was showing us the rack and he said this is we had good rain in the spring and early summer and you're looking at the rack and like the bases were the size of coke cans and he goes as you can look he goes as you see the past like two months of the summer we had drought so the the beginning of the rack is like super fat and massive but it peters out Oh really? Compared to the to the early growth, that early makes growth. a lot of sense. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I can't wait, man. I'm going deer hunting tomorrow, man. For uh, mule deer, mule deer. Yeah, yeah, I got a private tag. My my uncle actually, because uh, all my family lives around here. I grew up right here. Uh -huh. I moved away at 20 years old. Where'd you go? Could, Hermosa Beach, California. Oh, you had like the whole music thing going, right? Yeah, yep. And uh, so now back full circle, you know, raising my kids here, and it's awesome. My uncle came down from Kalispell. We were all out at elk camp. They're still out there, mm -hmm. actually, and uh, <clears throat> they came down. But we've been hunting on some private over here for years, and he's got a Pope and Young buck out of the spot I'm going really? tomorrow. Yeah, and it's that's just so awesome. the bucks are awesome, man, and it's, it's they're hardly pressured. It, you know, it, it, see, that's the difference. So, like, I live in Florida. I'm from Georgia, and the the our farm that we hunt our whitetail on is in America's Georgia, and like you guys don't see, it's just, it's totally different hunting. Yeah, like, like there's no pressure. All right, it's, it, you know, mostly public land, a lot of public land stuff. And in the South, like whitetails run from other whitetails. So our season starts in September and runs through January. And they are pursued all from, from the time it starts to the time it ends. And the season's crazy, right? Like you can take like eight deer. And Twelve. Yeah? As in a it, day? Yeah. If you, or in a season? No, in a day. Jeez, like well, your 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 quota for the for the season is twelve ten does and two bucks. Now, if you own land and you have agriculture, you can get depredation tax. Wow! And that to some people that might sound just like cold blooded killing and stuff, and in some instances it is. But it's management. I mean, it's managed by game and fish. Yeah, yeah. You, like if you were to come to our property, and we were to go, what? Let's see, it's five forty one. So that's seven forty one back home. They're going to start hitting those bean fields right now. So if we went and set up on the edge of a bean field with a spotting scope um, or my gargantuan loophole 15 by 56s, we would see in each field 40 to 50 deer without question. Like That's insane. Without question. And then the, our super big field, we'd see 40 on so one side. So are those southern white, considered a southern whitetail? So yeah, it's, I yeah. call it a southern whitetail. And they are – you don't understand how skittish they are. So, like, if you're sitting in a field – and you have, like, I, this has happened to me before. I was in Alabama with, at Brian Broderick's place. I'm in a tree stand, and to my right, I had four does. One of them was about to come in range, and I was going ring to ring it up. And then about 200 yards away, on the opposite end of the field, four deer entered. The deer closest to me saw these deer and ran like a striped-ass gorilla. <laughs> like someone had just come through the woods with a fire truck. They they're, they're, they're just, they just they don't sit still. They're constantly moving. Their heads up, down, like they're just constantly in a state of like 
Like just yeah, whitetail hunting is a whole other level, isn't mm-hmm. it? When Especially it in the south. Back. Yeah, but and that's what I love to do. It's a bucket list for me to get on a whitetail hunt, but I think I want to go to Montana to do it. Yeah, but but that's a totally different. It's way less pressure. That's a spot and stop. And the, and the population is substantially less. So if you were to come hunt with us in Georgia, you would buy your license, you'd get 10 doe tags and two buck tags. That's insane. Because that's how many deer are there. Yeah. And there used to be like this pride in meat hunting in the South. Now everything has shifted for the most part to trophy hunting. Like if it doesn't have, it's not a trophy buck, you're not going to shoot it because, the, you know what I mean? The, the whole, the narrative shifted and I think that's lame as shit. Um, and is it to let younger bucks mature so they have larger racks, well, you, or well, is that well, what's the well, concept? You, you definitely want to let deer mature. So if you're managing your property for trophy whitetails, and I wish my buddy Jeremy Starks was here because he's a wildlife biologist and the guy's obsessed with whitetail deer and the information. I've learned more hanging out with him in the past six months about whitetail than I have in 30 years of hunting. Really? I'm not kidding. So... All every whitetail buck that exists on this planet has the potential to get to 140 inches. Wow! Every single one of them. I don't care what he looks like at one. I don't care what he looks like at two, three, or four. They all have the potential to get to 140. And if you are managing for trophy deer, you do not shoot bucks a day less than six and a half years old. You want them to get to maturity. Three and a half year old, four, and I've shot tons of three and a half and four year olds. I have. Um, but if you really want to manage your deer population for massive whitetails, yeah. don't shoot any of your bucks till they're six and a half. Cold buck hunting, there's no such thing. It does not exist. I was shooting cold bucks, la- cold bucks last year. I met Jeremy on a turkey hunt in Florida. I will never shoot a deer I label a cold buck the rest of my life after hanging out with him. And th- that's because they did two 25-year studies, University of Texas and Texas A&M. They did two 25 year studies on deer populations on on identical properties 25 years all right culling doesn't work it doesn't change anything nothing like literally nothing and there are people that are listening to this i'll be like say i'm full of shit well we'll get the hate and me and me (laughs) and me and me seven (laughs) months ago i'd have said absolutely call call bucks yes i shoot the shit out of call bucks i won't ever do it again so um and you also want your buck to doe ratio to be as close to one to one as possible. Okay. So, if you have too is many, is that a genetics thing or is it? No, it's a, you want your so one. If 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 your buck to doe ratio, let's say you got ten does for every buck you have, when the rut comes in, those bucks are going to kill themselves, trying fighting over the deer and trying to breed them. Yeah. Okay. So it's just it, there's just too many. They can't handle it. They'll they'll run themselves into the ground. They won't eat. They won't sleep. That's kind of what crazy. goes on here with the elk, man. I've seen elk gore each other, you know, right here and on the golf course and stuff. It's well, insane. When, when, when they fight, they're trying to kill each other. Yeah, literally. That's it. They'll be best friends one day, and then all of a sudden they're mortal oh, enemies. For, for They're bros all summer. I've seen bulls running together, like 300-class bulls in the velvet on the Evans Ranch, you know, all summer long. And they're, then, they're just like humans. Yeah. Dudes hang out with dudes, and chicks hang out with chicks. And you and sometimes you'll meet girls. No offense to anybody listening, but like, you'll meet females. Like I only like I only hang out, I only have guy friends. It's like, what? what why? What, why? What's wrong? Is something wrong with you? What do you mean you only have guy friends? You don't like. What do you mean you don't like girls? Like you are a girl. Like what are you talking about? Right. Um, like you don't. It's you'll never see like a bachelor group of of bucks or bulls with like one one, one cow dough. or one doe. <laughs> yeah. yeah. You're like, what, what? What are you doing? Why are you here? Are you lost? You know. <laughs> but. Um, when Humans that, are complicated, man. <laughs> we are. We're so stupid. We're, so stupid. we're, we're, we're the so worst. Dumb. We are the worst. We have blinders on half the time. You know, it's like what we think is important. We're the worst. <laughs> yeah. Especially Americans. Like we, oh, we, dude. yeah. I mean, we've got it figured out, but we have no clue what's Especially going on. Especially right now, man. It's um, been a fucking shit show. Uh, that's another topic I can get into. There's just no leadership. Let me get into that because uh, let me just say this: okay. there's no leadership. Oh, I agree 100 percent with you. And we're, like, if you think about, think about like times in your life. And for people listening, like whether you played sports or you're doing the music thing or you, you were a member of a team, all right? And whenever there's two people in a room and a decision has to be made, someone has to be in charge. 100%. Some, someone's got to be in charge. And look back, and I get chills thinking about this, look back on your life that there were people that you worked with and for that you would have done anything for. 
Why? It's because they were leaders. 100%. You know? yep. And so if you look now, and this is on both sides of the spectrum, all they do, I want someone, when it, Black Baker on Instagram, send me a DM. If you can find a politician on both sides of the aisle that's offering a solution. All right. they do is talk shit and post memes and do gotcha moments. They're a bunch of, they're, they're like Yelpers talking shit, leaving shitty reviews. Yep. They don't, no one is offering solutions to problems. It's all trying to get the other guy. You know, Biden sucks at it. Trump sucked at leadership. Um, I think Obama offered some leadership characteristics. I think Bush offered some leadership characteristics. And I think that Clinton had some leadership characteristics. Were those three guys perfect? No, they were not. No. But did they offer solutions to problems during their presidencies? Yeah, they did. They really did. You know, um, they did kind of drop the hammer a few times and like, this is what we're going to do. You know, yeah, like, like they at e each one of those presidencies, there were times during their presidency when the countries united behind those guys. Yeah. And that wasn't the case in the previous, the current and the previous, you know, like I, I don't I, it, it, it's unfortunate. And like that's like I'm a conservative. I'm a Republican. I donate money to, uh, to people running. But the thing like I'm calling out my own party on like social media and like mocking some of the dumb shit I see because it's like. I think Bill Clinton was asked, and I think Bill Clinton was a good president, morally, morally bankrupt dude, but like sure. as a as a president, I think he was a good president. He was a he was a great governor, and he, I think he was a good president. Um, someone asked him, they said, "What would you do if you? What advice would you give Donald Trump?" And he said, "I would tell him this: You're the president of the United States, and every day you wake up and you have the opportunity to do something epic, and that's true." And then I started thinking about it, and I was like, that doesn't just extend to the president. I have an opportunity every fucking day to wake up and do something epic. Yeah. We all do, and we can all make this country better. And we, ha we as a society, whether you are on the right or the left, I don't care, but we need, as a collective, the citizens of this country, need to start holding our elected representatives accountable. And if you voted for Biden, you need to hold him accountable. And if you're a Trump guy, you need to hold his family accountable. But no one's doing that. It's just we've delved into this just sh quagmire shit talk. And you I'm, know? I'm just as guilty of it. But I, the first thing I do when I start seeing something I don't like is I just turn it off. I'm like, I can't take this shit anymore, you know? Dude, when, when on January the 6th, when, you know, Trump, I would say Trump officially lost the election. I guess that's the day. Um, I just started unfollowing people. And I did I run about 24 different Twitter accounts. Right. I, I mean a lot of them. And I just started unfollowing and muting people just talking shit, man. It's just like I can't. I can't yeah. deal with it, dude. And it just it, it like We um, even got roped into it. And we we don't cover politics at all. This is yeah. the most we've ever talked about politics. No, and this on and this, this podcast, is I'm not just for people listening like I'm not talking about politics. I'm talking about our country yeah, yeah. and and leadership. And it's not just politics. It's like um where you work and your friends and your circle and your family, like we all need to hold each other accountable. Hunters, we need to hold hunters accountable. Like you see, I couldn't agree dumb more. Shit on social media, yeah. and like there's just, I don't know. It's a crazy time, and we don't. What, what we were saying was yes, we are Americans. We got it all figured. We're we're the greatest country in the world, and we're the luckiest country in the world. And every day, like I've spent a ton of time outside of this country, like a lot, and I have seen poverty and suffering at a level that most people. Unless you've served in the military downrange, you you have no idea. Like I mean, like I've like I've been to Central America I think forty three times. Like yep. poverty, abstract poverty. I've been to Africa a ton. Like seen people walking around with like no shoes. Like over there, like they don't worry about taxes or their electricity bill. Like that's yeah. not they don't have those things. It's not even. It's like where am I going to get water? Yeah, where or am I going to get food? Or am I going to get eaten by a lion today? Yeah, is a hippo going to charge our village and just destroy our crops? Things like that, like Twitter, they don't know what that shit is. And even some of those cities where you can buy some of those things, there's people that are so impoverished that, like in South America, they're laying on the street with gangrene. There, you don't see that in the U.S. Oh, you no, know no, what I mean? No, like it, listen, it, is, it doesn't matter who you are in this country. Yeah, if you're rich or poor, if you're the richest man or the poorest person. And something's wrong with you. You will be t you will be taken care of. Yeah, I want you to think about this. Tell me another time in the history of the world where poor people were fat. God, Th now think about that. Yeah, let your mind trickle back in hundreds, thousands of years. 
everyone in this country, like, yes, there are kids that go to sleep hungry, but like, and, and I, and I hate that about like kids, dogs, the elderly, those are the three things that if you want to see me crack someone's head on the ground, let me witness something done yep. in I, that, you I know what I mean? I don't, you, yeah. I, I just, that's I, I, like all, all form of rational thought leaves my body. Like I, I don't, I have no tolerance for that. And, um, Yes, our medical system is completely screwed up. My brother's a physician, and to hear mm-hmm. him talk about how just the the billing, medical billing, oh, God. and then is, you got the pharmacies involved and uh, dude, pharmaceutical companies, and like it's it's it's, just, it's insane. And it's, that goes back to leadership, yeah, and holding people accountable for you know, like if I have friends that do dumb shit, I, I check them. I'm like, hey man, yeah, like don't do that again. D- yeah, don't. No, no, no. That's not going to happen. Right. Um, but like, if you're there's food for people. There's medical care. There's medical stuff. And like, um, we, we got it made over here, man. We really do. And like, think about this. Tell me another country where you can go hunt on public land. I'm sitting here waiting. Tell me another country where you can do that. There isn't. Where you where you um, you have to be mega wealthy. Yeah. In other countries to go. And hunt. tell me another spot that has so much public land like millions colorado has 40 i think 40 percent of it is public land yeah though i, I i'm 43 not 43 percent or something like yeah that. it's some yeah like western states man are just it's yeah. bananas it's, it's completely insane. bananas yeah um like the wilderness area that we were in it backs up to rocky mountain national park it backs up to two wilderness areas i mean you could go for miles yeah you can go camping you can take yeah. a tent and go live up there yeah it's yours do whatever you want just don't it's, litter. Don't be an asshole. Exactly. Follow, follow, follow game laws. And that's the whole reason why we started this is because, you know, like, for example, the base camp that we pulled into, you could see everywhere somebody went to the bathroom, whoever previously camped. Yeah. There, because they just surfaced, left their toilet paper. Every It's like, come on, come on, man. Do better. So we're just trying to educate people a little bit on that. You know, that was kind of my main purpose for Listen, starting this whole podcast. There is no person that hates feces worse than me. Yeah. <laughs> no, I'm serious, man. Yeah. Like I'll st- I, I like I'll age calves. I'll stick my arm up a cow's uterus right. and feel the skull. I, like that stuff doesn't bother me. Guts doesn't bother me. Blood doesn't bother me. Injuries doesn't don't bother me. Things like that just don't bother me. Fe- warm feces? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> don't go to San Francisco. I no, oh yeah. <laughs> Dude, they spent 38 million dollars uh, last year cleaning up fecal matter on the oh streets. Oh my god. It's so bad. I throw away shoes whenever I have to go to that city. Oh really? Yeah, I just fucking throw away my shoes. I have so I when I was in college, I did three summer internships in San Francisco. My aunt, my aunt was mm-hmm. an investment banker, and so I was out there three summers. And then after, when I finished college, I was there for a year and a half. I worked for Thomas Wiseau Partners, an investment bank, and um, I'm terrified to go back to San Francisco. Yeah, I don't, I don't, I don't want to see it. Like the memories that I have of how epic that city was in in the late '90s, like super. No, badass. you don't want to go. I, no. No. it's totally different. Totally different. Can't do it. No, I'm yeah. not going to. I'm not going to. Fucking bananas. It is. It's a, no, but like, and that's and then, another example of not having a leader. You yeah. know, like, oh god, the, ab- the yeah. absolute absence of leadership. Yeah, yeah. It's all like everything. It's a. It's m- personal motivation. You yeah. Know? Like, people are nuts. But. Yeah. I get off on tangents. I gotta. So. I gotta know too because I got you in here. Mm-hmm. I got some questions for okay. you. You know. So what's new at Black Rifle? You guys are just. I mean, every time I see it, it's like a rocket ship, and you guys are doing cool shit. I love following you guys. I love following what's going on, and the community that you guys have built So is so fucking epic, yeah. I think. It's just it's good people. Everybody that I've met from there, including yourself, have just been good people to so, be around. So the thing that's interesting about Black Rifle is, like, um, like Evan – so Evan, Matt – Jared Taylor and Richard Ryan. Those are the four dudes that started the company, all right? None of them came from money, all right? All except Richard grew up in the military. I mean, uh, we're in the military. Richard grew up dirt poor, all right? Richard moved to L.A. when he was 20, lived in his truck, all right? Um, Jared Taylor grew up in Whidbey Island, Washington, graduated high school, joined the Air Force, uh, and tricked his way from basic training into a, tr- a tryout for Air Force Special Operations and became a TAC PJ TAC. Great story. Yeah. Dude showed up looking for guys. He was like, yeah, yeah, right, I'm right here. And he wasn't one of those guys, but he <laughs> made it. And he was a phenomenal, phenomenal at his job. One of the most talented human beings I've ever been in the presence of. Uh, emotional IQ, zero. 
<laughs> and I'll say this to his face, but Jared is like the things that he can do with music and and like he, it, it's his voice singing and his creativity and like film level and it's 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 off the charts. It's amazing, it's phenomenal. So he's the first person I met. All right, he hasn't changed one bit. He hasn't gotten better. He hasn't gotten worse. He's the same person I met seven years ago. Hasn't approved, hasn't digressed or regressed. He's J- it's just, to quote Matt, it's just Jared. Right. Super talented dude. All right. And then <clears throat> you have Matt. Matt uh, grew up in California in um, like middle, lower middle class, you know, lower mm-hmm. class, you know, not poor, but poor, you know, not like dirt floor poor, but, you know, yeah. and his, his brother's. Like getting by. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Um, and his dad was a, like a cop and a, and a, uh, and a, and a musician. Um, and Matt, uh, skinny little shit, uh, growing up six to <laughs> two thirty now beast of a dude. Yeah. Uh, he's an army ranger and he worked for the CIA. <clears throat> and like when I met Matt, um, Matt was like the face, like Matt is a, 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 a absolutely handsome Good Chisel looking jaw, dude. The yeah, whole, he's got yeah, the, the fucking yeah. jawline. He's six two, two twenty five, two thirty, ripped. Like just, like just you, guys want to be him. Girls want to be with him. Right. That's Matt. And like I, I was wrong about Matt a lot initially. I thought he was just like the talent, you know. And I didn't know that Matt would evolve into this awesome business dude, you know. Um, and and I was like, I just didn't expect it. But the really interesting thing about Matt is, and in, in, in Black Rifle was started, I might get in trouble for saying this, I don't give a shit, 1800 bucks in the bank. Really? No rich uncles, no inheritance, no nothing, just hard work. They didn't, have, so any mo- they didn't have any money. Yeah. They just busted their ass. 1800 bucks. Black Rifle mm-hmm. will do a quarter of a billion dollars in sales this year. Whew. Should. In and around that area. Yeah. And I'm, I apologize if I, I'm not supposed to I say that. I love seeing it in stores and like, it's everywhere, you know, dude. it's right up here. It's, it's crazy. A, you can get it at Big R. You can get it at Bass Pro Shop. You can get it at all these spots. It it's, is. So, yeah. so you're, so watching those dudes take 1800 bucks and turn it in and do a quarter of a billion in sales this year. I've been there the whole time watching. I've been in the circle of friends. I wasn't in the circle of business. You know what I mean? Like I was a consultant sure. and I just that I, I wasn't involved in the day to day. I was doing the things that I was hired to do. But I've watched Matt mature and develop as a super accomplished businessman. The cool thing about Matt is that I've been able to physically watch Matt improve in his music, his singing, his video chops, his creativity, his story writing. Like, dude. Um, it's been phenomenal. He is so freaking talented right now. And I think he's like, it's like you wonder like what would happen with Black Rifle, like let's say in 10 years down the road, like what are these guys going to be doing? Well, Matt's going to be a professional musician. Like Matt has like, had like the top, Matt and JT had, I think, eight of the top 15 comedy songs on iTunes last year or the past two years. And like Matt's putting out songs now and like consulting with actual like real accomplished billboard musicians like dude i'm telling you it's been a phenomenal i didn't even know that about oh dude the problem is and like every time he puts out a new song i'm like hey man like when are you going to get serious and stop with the fucking joke songs bro like he did a song called um a blind date unbelievable but he put a little humor in there it's a it's it's a blind date it's about a deer blind with his wife noel okay but the song is awesome it's epic. So Matt has developed as a businessman over the past seven and a half years. But the thing that's cool thing about him is you can actually fee- see the improvements in like his, his physical skills. And you don't see that a lot. You know what I mean? Sure. Evan has gone. So Evan and then so Evan grew up poor as shit. Not poor as shit, but poor, poor. Like in Idaho. His dad managed a machine shop and was a logger. All right. Yeah. And he went to University of Idaho. And Evan became a Green Bay, a Green Beret. Evan was involved in the invasion of Iraq. And then he worked for the CIA. Like, Evan deployed, like, over 300 days a year for, like, eight, nine, ten years, That's dude. That's insane, man. And, like, it's funny. Like, we had that fallout from, like, that New York Times article. And I've never – and, like, I hosted – I co-hosted a podcast with Evan called Launch Code for years. Yeah. Hundreds of episodes. 
And the reason I co-hosted it with him was because Evan would have all his buddies from Spec Ops and shit, like the, the special operations community on, and they'd start talking. And I'm like, hey, man, no one listening knows what in the hell you're talking about. Like, yeah, dude, like, no what does that mean? <laughs> and so, like, I, I brought a different perspective. So, And I do have, you have a military background? I do, I do not. Oh, okay. um, I get asked that every time I go to the airport. You a veteran? No, 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 no. <laughs> but um, my brother was, so was my dad. Um, so I've heard hundreds of Evan's war stories. And I have never, ever once, ever, and, and, they, and if you were to ask those guys, they would tell you that I interrogate the shit out of them because I'm fascinated by what they did. Um, I've never had, heard Evan Hafer tell us, so there I was story. It's always like some hilarious ass, funny component to the, like, and this is not Jason Bourne, but like yeah. to the lay person, it's Jason Bourne type stuff, you know? But like, it's all humor based. I've never heard Evan Hafer say, like I was a badass, or what I did. You like he's yeah. just he never talked about that. Um, he's not a quiet professional, but when it comes to like the seriousness of the job, he's as quiet a professional as there, there is. You yeah. Know? Um, like he'll tell he'll, he tells a story. He's like, yeah, I was in like North Africa waiting on a plane to show up, and this you know it was it was a I don't remember the name of the plane. It was some piece of shit beater that like a, it was a Ukraine it was a, a Ukraine plane with like a like a Slovak crew. And he, this guy walks off with his just grease covered hands and like there's fuel and diesel and hydraulic fuel all over the inside <laughs> of the plane. And he's like, all I can think about is this fucker's peeling a hard boiled egg and his hands were so <laughs> filthy. But see, that's the story. Yeah. The story is an obscure runway in Northern Africa. And he's like, and this, the, what he remembers is like some Eastern European uh, eating a, with a, a hard boiled egg with greasy hands, you know, just crazy stuff like that. Yeah. And, um, He's just, it's just f fascinating to hear. And like, but we caught a bunch of shit from that New York Times article. Yeah. And Evan went on Joe Rogan and, and he, and he texted me afterwards. That he it texted me afterward. He goes, What'd you think? And I said, It's the first time you ever stood up for yourself. He said, What the fuck are you talking about? I was like, Because he, he said, He goes, If the people talking shit about me or my company were to just take a snapshot of what my previous job was like, just a snapshot of my brain, the things that I dealt with on a daily basis, their heads would implode. Yeah. He's like, you know, I used to ride around Mosul and Kabul in the back of a beater Corolla wearing a burqa presenting as an, Af uh, 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 an, uh, an Arabic female. Right. You know, with a, with, a, with a saw between his legs under a black burqa going through checkpoints, you know. And like he never, that's the first time he's ever said anything like that. Yeah. And I was like, dude, I'm really proud of you. He's like, what? he's like, I don't get it. I was like, man, you've never, that's the first time you've ever said I was, was a bad motherfucker without saying I was a bad motherfucker. Like that's, that's, that's all you needed to say. Yeah. You know? So I, I, I worship those guys. Like, and that's, that's leadership. So that's like, I am, I am blessed with the fact that I've been able to spend seven and years of my life with those guys and see what real, real leadership is. You know, yep. like I know that no matter what happens to me, I can call, Evan Hafer or Matt Best or Logan and say, hey, guys, I'm in trouble. I need some help. No matter what the ask was, if I needed a kidney, I'd get one. That's fucking awesome. Yeah. And, that, yeah. and, 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 and but what all, what's also phenomenal is the people that I've had the opportunity to meet. And this is really cool. So my father uh, was in fifth group special forces for 22 years. My dad went through the second Q course ever. My dad died in 1981. I was five years old. My brother Mitchell was seven weeks old at my parents' anniversary party at our beach house. All right, crazy shit. So I never, I, I have memories of my father, but I never knew my dad, and I've always been fascinated with that because, like, my dad. So uh, you ever, you've seen guys you, they get this thing called a combat yep. CIB. Yep. All right, that means they've been in combat. So my dad got his CIB in Laos in 1960. Whew. Yeah. So and you so hear you hear people talk about SOG or Mac V SOG. And all that stuff. My dad did one tour with SOG, one with Mac V. He did two with Fifth Group. That's just in Vietnam. Wow. You know, my dad spoke English, German, Cambodian, Laotian, and Vietnamese. Epic shit. So the more time I spend with these guys, the yeah. more I learn about who my father was. And that's super special and powerful to me. So, like, because I, I, and I sit around and I see them, and it's like I see what I hope my father well, I know my dad had the characteristics that Evan Hafer has. I, I know he does. I know he did. Yep. And so um, I was sitting around with them. And so and my brother was a force recon marine. Now my brother is a physician. All right. My brother, his last deployment was North Africa. Um, 
Liberia, and Charles Taylor was pulled out and taken off to The Hague. My brother was there. Comes back, goes to college. My brother was a dumbass growing up. Like, my, <laughs> my brother, like, legitimately, like, he'll tell you he's a piece of shit, all right? Um, and we were like, you're going to join the military, or you're going to just go away, because you're just, you're, you're, like, what's wrong with you? Joins Marines, goes through uh, boot camp, uh, uh, school, SOI, School of Infantry, and then he goes to amphibious recon, recon indoctrination. 9-11 kicks off. He goes over there. He did, I think he was in six, six years, 1998-2004. So, um, and so you've been around this your whole life. Uh, and much, fascinated yeah. by it my yeah. whole life. And for some reason, dude, like, um, this is going to sound really, really douchey. But, like, um, I don't know how else to say it. So I grew up in Savannah, Georgia. That's where First Ranger Bat is. And there's just, there's not, when you grow up in private school your whole life, and everything's paid for. So, like, my, not, I'm not saying, like, I, I didn't come from, like, super rich family, but, like, upper class, all right? Uh, you know, um, went to private school my whole life. Turned 16, got a car. Uh, um, went to college. College was paid for. All that stuff. If, and if, But I've worked my whole life. Like, I started picking up cigarette butts. My, my family owns shop, like, commercial real estate shopping centers. And I started picking up cigarette butts when I was 12. But it's weird growing up like that, um, at least my experience with it, is there's, there's not a lot of patriotism. I know one person from my hometown besides my brother. No, my brother, Chris Downing, and Michael Schraus. Those are the three people that I know that will join the military. Really? It's weird. I don't know a single person from college that went in the military. So, like, we, I'm not going to. It's crazy because my friends, they all kind of felt like being from a small mountain town and stuff. They had nowhere to go. Maybe they weren't smart enough to go to college. And they all went in, signed up, and then 9-11 hit, and even more of them were like, fuck that, we're going. See, we didn't have that. Yeah. We didn't have that. Really? None. No. Nobody. Seriously. What do you got there? What is that? It's a Zen. It's nicotine. Yeah? Yeah. Can I try one? Yeah. Three milligrams. All right. It's new, new you pot, spit new, it, or what do you do? Is swallow, it like chew? No, you okay. swallow it. Yeah, I quit dipping uh, I used to ago. dip. I probably uh, shouldn't be doing this. No, it's <laughs> This will be it, my new vice. No, it, it, they're great. <laughs> but um, so there wasn't a lot of patriotism um growing up mm -hmm. and it, it, i'm not saying we didn't look down on the military but it was like it's like you know you grow up in a in a privileged family in a privileged life and there's expectations and those expectations that are bestowed upon you is that you have to achieve greatness and you need to make a lot of money otherwise you're a failure and you're a loser and that's the way i don't so want you just write that off you're just like go make go, yeah. yeah you have yeah. to be successful sure and like in it just the military this is i sound like an asshole saying this but this is how it was 20 years ago like there's three guys i went to high school with that joined the military and that isn't in all of savannah 19 schools in my hometown all right mm -hmm. second biggest city in the state of georgia um i know three guys that joined the military i don't know anybody from college that went in the military not one person but it's like you go to college you join a fraternity and well you you, you, you play football growing up all right and then if you're good enough you're gonna play in college which i was and i did and I, I was good enough to get to college. I was a shitty college football player. Like I, I learned on the third third day, I sucked. I was damn good in high school, but I was not it's a good a college jump. Player. It's a big jump. It's a big commitment, dude. too, man. Oh, it's the worst. Yeah. So you with like you hear people say like, oh, daddy's money. It's like, but with daddy's money comes expectations. Sure. Like a low income job isn't going to cut it. It's not acceptable. So I did not. Joined the military. I went and I played college, football in college, and then I played soccer at University of Georgia on the men's club team my last years. And then I played like a few years of like semi-pro soccer, I guess you could call. This is the late 90s. Um, and got into real estate and just started killing it. Like literally killing it. And um, I've read every Navy SEAL Green Beret book that exists. And like, you know, like I just, it drives me crazy, man. And so in between, and I was very, very successful in real estate. And between 2008 and 2010, I lost a total of about $15 million. I lost everything I had. I lost, Holy uh, shit. I lost, I lost a wife, which is a godsend. Thank you, Jesus, if you're listening for this. <laughs> um, uh, listening, maybe? Well, well, she, she's, you know, yeah. But um, I, I lost everything I had. I felt sorry for myself for about 48 hours. And ever since my dad died, the one thing that I had no tolerance for was self-pity. Or more importantly, pity from others. Like daddy, like father, son, camping trips and shit. Like, I don't want you fucking feeling bad for me. Yep. Fuck you if you do. And my mother will tell you, she's like, I've, she, my mother will tell you that never once 
in her life has she ever worried about me. My brother, she was worried sick constantly about me. And she'll say, Baker wanted to raise himself. I didn't have the strength to fight him. And I knew no matter what happened to him, he would be able to get himself out of trouble, no matter where he was in the world. And so lost everything. I was like, this is stupid. I was, my brother had, had just started medical school. And he was like, you know, he's like, you should do this program called Rep 63 or Rep 62, which is going into the guard. And then you have an immediate tryout into special forces. So you go through special forces selection. And I was 50 miles away from Camp Blanding to just, I was going to do that. But I had, I had an inguinal hernia and um, a bum shoulder. And my brother, he's like, he's like, the physical stuff will be super easy for you. He said, you'll, the, the, where you'll have challenges is you've lived a really comfortable life. And you'll go from making hundreds and hundreds of thousands of dollars a year. But you'll have a college where you'll be an E4. You'll make like 34 grand. And I was like, I don't care at this point. At that point, I was disgusted by money. I hated it. Sure. I, I was, it was grossed out by it. So I was like, well, I'm, I have an inguinal hernia and my shoulder was completely shot from football. And so I was like, all right, I got to do something. So I started going through the interview process to be a, a defense foreign service agent. A foreign service agent, I think Department of State is what it is. And I got through like the second phase of the interview process. And I was like, well, if I have, a, a, if I have language and medical, then – somebody's going to want me like so I went to NYU to get a master's degree in Arabic hardest thing I've ever attempted to do in my life study speak it fluently no no hell no I did I can't even count to 10 <laughs> so I did not finish I don't yeah. have a, I don't have a master's degree but, okay so I get to New York and I remember my car got towed and I had to walk like it was like 80 blocks so Manhattan is four miles wide 12 miles long and I was like as punishment I'm going to walk my ass to that lot and I just started walking 80 blocks and I just remember looking around and I was like none of these people care about my problems and yeah. I don't care about their problems because everybody's trying to survive up here and at that moment I knew I was going to be okay because I, I thought at that point my life was over I was like you know I'm never going to make money again. I'll never be successful I'll never have fun. Right. Like, it's a one-time it's, shot my life's or over. something. Yeah, I, I, don't, I don't know what it was. It was just. But then, correct me if I'm wrong, you went in, went on to start multiple companies, right? So like, that was, Kill Cliff was one of yeah, them. Yeah, that right? was in August of 2010. We started Two Pood, which is a CrossFit apparel company that we sold three years ago uh, in December of 2010. Are you still involved with that industry we, at all? Uh, a little bit. Yeah. We sold uh, we sold Two Pood. Um, made a bunch of money on that. Not a bunch, but made good money. And then... Um, we started that with seventeen thousand dollars and sold it for not a hundred times more than that, but you get yeah. my point a lot. Yeah, yeah. Um, and then we started Killcliff in January of two thousand and eleven, and then grew that from zero to sixteen million in like three years. Which is a great company, man. I love their product. Great. By the well, way, it is. Yeah. It is now. It is yeah. now. It is now. So the story with Killcliff was so. The, I've only recently learned about it in the last year. So year the, and a half. the the founder of Killcliff was Todd Earl. He was a former SEAL. And um, we were off to the races, and we were going, you know, just going nuts, and we needed to bring on money to keep growing, so we brought on a venture capital group out of Boston, and that turned out to be a massive mistake. We, we got the wrong money from the wrong guys. And then they thought it was the product. It wasn't the brand. It's like, no, people want to be a part of the brand. They don't give a shit about this, what's in the can. Yeah. You know? And so, and then they somehow finagled a way to remove Todd from power, and then they put in a couple just beta male CEOs. And now, John Timar is the CEO. Timar was a SEAL. Timar is awesome. He's a brown belt, brown belt in jiu-jitsu, um, and he's great. Um, but, yeah, and then I did Kill Cliff for seven years, and then I should have left after five, but I, st I was the last man standing from the original team. And it just the, – the, the guy that was – the CEO at the time um, – can I cuss? I've been cussing. Yeah, man. A, dude, he was a, This is not a family show. He was a complete and total fucking pussy. <laughs> absolute yeah. absence of leadership. Absolute absence of leadership. Todd Erlich, you waked up every morning, you woke up every morning, and the last thing you want to do is let him down. And that's leadership. That's, yeah. what I, that's what it has with Evan. Like, the last thing this world I ever want to do is disappoint Evan Haver. Under any circumstance. Everything I do involving the company, I pretend he's sitting beside me and watching me. And that's how I don't make mistakes. That's how it should be. I don't yeah. make mistakes that way. So... And so they got rid of um, that beta cuck, and they brought in John Timar, and now everything's back to normal. They're off to the fucking races. They're doing great. But um, I left Killcliff and started a company called Digital Mongoose, which is a marketing consulting firm, on January the third, two thousand sixteen. 
And I remember talking to Evan Hafer at like 10 a.m. that morning. And I was like, give me a piece of advice. He goes, you need to be more diplomatic with the way you approach things. Because I was a hothead, dude. Like, I'd go high order on people. Because I thought, and like, I was the best thing that ever happened to Killcliffe. That's the only time I'll ever say that in my life is I was the best thing. And I've always said, if I'm the best thing we got, we're fucked. Right. And I mean that. Because <laughs> like, the guy that the guy that's in the best position is, the, is the low man on the totem pole. He has the most to gain. The guy at the top of the totem pole isn't going to learn shit. Right. The guy at the bottom, he has everything to learn. So, um, and then just everything's just been great since then. I've learned a ton. And I, I remember, like, I got sidetracked. So, I've, I'm good at doing that to people, too, I do it by all the, the way. time. But one, one thing I wanted to say was, like, you know, with regards to, like, military and special forces and all that stuff, like, I remember, so I was a hyper kid, dude. I started taking Ritalin in 1982 when I was seven years old, all right? I'm 45 now. And I needed it to, to. I was just, I was crazy. Not, not in a bad way, but I was just super hyper and I wanted to be outside doing fun stuff and just having a good time. I wanted to do what I wanted to do. I wasn't bad. I didn't do weird shit. I just, a lot of energy. And, um, and then when the whole real estate thing started going to shit, like I had some investors that I wanted to punish and when I say punish I mean in the worst possible way because the market where the economy was crashing banks were closing no one could get loans but they accused what year was this 2008 is when it started okay. when the crash started yeah and they accused everyone of stealing like we had accounting we had letters from the bank they're like this is the economy and the where we're no one's stolen any money they're like, they just this one doctor dr. Bishop just didn't believe that sued everybody he sued the title company Damn. How do you sue a title company? Like, I don't, you know what I mean? So yeah. he, they, and it was just, I couldn't handle that. And so I went and started talking to a psychiatrist because I was just pissed off all the time. I couldn't sleep. Um, when I could fall asleep, it was just fretful sleep and I wouldn't sleep much. And so I started taking Lexapro. I'd take. What is Lexapro? It's an antidepressant. I was take five milligrams. It's the smallest dose that you can take of that stuff. And it would just take the edge off for me and I wouldn't dwell on stuff. All mm -hmm. right. And then I just, I proceeded to take, so I, and I stopped taking Ritalin and started taking Concerta, which was an adult version, time release version of, of Ritalin. So I was taking Concerta and Lexapro. And I remember sitting in San Antonio and it was Evan Hafer, Matt Best, Jared Taylor, Richard Ryan was in the room. I think Logan was there and there was a couple of Evans, like special forces friends that I knew. And I was sitting there looking at them and I was looking at every single one of them and I was like, what is the difference between me and them? Like, what is the difference? They're not smarter than me. Their IQ is not high. And this, I don't mean to sound like a douchebag, but I've always tested really off the charts. They're not smarter than me. They're not more athletic than me. They're not more physically gifted than me. They're not. So what is it? What's the difference between me and these guys? And I realized that what they had was self-control. And I was like, well, I don't have any self-control. That's why I take Concerta and Lexapro. And then I was like, wait a minute. Fuck this shit. I have as much self-control as anybody in this room. I just have to activate the self-control right. and control it. Self-discipline. That's all it is. Yeah. And you know what I did that day? Stop taking both medications. Haven't taken one. Good for one. you, ha man. Haven't That's taken, fucking awesome. Haven't taken one since. I've told six people, you're the sixth person and all your listeners now. Yeah. So I was just, and that's another thing like. Well, I think it, there's value in sharing stuff like yeah. that because somebody might be in your same situation. You know, we've done it on multiple podcasts where it just like something comes out like, Hey, you know, my dad tried to kill my mom or whatever, you know, like. And but it, that's another thing. Like, that's leadership. Like, yeah. Evan pulled that, not on purpose, but just being around him pulled that out of me. So you do better. And I just was thinking, I was like, all right, self-control. I can do this. Like, I'll just focus. I'll force myself to focus more on stuff. Instead of bouncing around and chasing, you know, squirrels and shiny balls, I'll just sit down and I'll say, for the next 30 minutes, I'm going to work on this task and I am not going to do a single thing else. I'm going to turn my phone over. I'm not going to look at my phone. I'm not going to stop until this task or this email or this, this proposal is complete. And then I'll look at my phone and check Twitter and see what people are fighting about. Right. And that's what I did. That's yeah. What I did. It's hard, man. Like these fucking phones, man. Sometimes I'll pick it up and it'll automatically go to Instagram. I'm like, God damn it. I don't want to even so, see that. You know, like about two months ago, I turned off all my notifications. Mm -hmm. The only way I know if I get an email, a text, or anything on socials, I have to go and look. That's the same thing with so me. So yeah. I have to. See, so you're getting notifications now. See, I don't have that. Nothing. See, my phone hasn't gone off once. Yeah. 
None of that. I won't allow it because the phone starts to control us. And then like you spend your life, like if you think about our grandparents, our grandparents can quote dates and years, like it's just rapid fire. Remember phone numbers? Oh yeah. You know why? (laughs) It's because they haven't spent their time staring at a phone. So like when you're, when you're going, like when you're hunting or you're going to like a, a, like a motocross race or something like that and you see all these people at a concert and they're staring at their phone recording stuff, they're not going to remember it. They have to go back and watch it to remember it because they're focused on the screen, not the moment. And so that's my, another thing I started doing is focusing on the moment where I am, not being distracted by the phone. Because, yeah. like, I have so much going on in my life and in my head. Like, I'm constantly working through problems, coming up with ideas, solutions to problems, things we should do, where we should go, what, you know, just, and it's like, I just, I need, there's times when I just need to decompress. Because it just, like, I'll go So crazy. what do you do personally for that is, I know you're a big hunter. Like, Read. You, yeah? Not, a, not, not on a Kindle, though. Mm-hmm. Read a book with paper. Not because on a Kindle, like I've read so many books on Kindle. Kindle, and here comes your notification. I can't. Right? T- I can't <laughs> tell you the name of the book, yeah. but with a with a physical book in my hand, it's different. Uh-huh. Um, so I'm a big person at having something in your hand too. Yeah. Right? So I I read a ton, a, 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 a substantial amount. Um, a great book, if anyone's listening, is uh, Lions at the Gate, um, which is about the Six Day War in Israel. Like you want to read about some shit? Yeah. Read that book. Dude. Okay. It is, I'm gonna put it on my list. It, it, Lions at the Gate. Down, Jerry. Lions at the Gate, dude, it is so good. Oh my God, it's amazing. Um, and then right now I'm reading Lion, uh, Death in the Long Grass, which is because I've hunted in Africa a bunch and I want to go back this summer and I kind of got the itch to get back. So Yeah, you've hunted all over the world. Uh, four you? continents, yeah. yeah. Wow. And you know what's weird? It's like I, 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 I did that because I felt obligated to do it and people, uh, like I needed to do that. It has, like, it's not like in 2017 I hunted in, I think, Three continents in 11 states. Worst year of hunting in my life. It was awful. Horrible. Because well, it felt like a job or something? Or? Yeah. Yeah. So, like, when your passion becomes your job, it's no longer yeah. your passion. So, like, one thing I do um, with the new role at Black like Rifle. Like, having a podcast has ruined podcasts for me. Really? A little bit. I mean, yeah. I love to listen to other people. I love to learn new shit. But then I'm sitting there thinking about, like, how can I critique myself or how can I make myself better and it's not a jealousy thing or anything like that it's not it's just i want to improve on what i'm doing here yeah, so you it's start like critiquing i start listening to it different you know it's like when i go to a concert because i've been in that industry for so long i start looking at the production value you know like oh yeah i wonder what it took to put this yeah, in yeah. or they should have done that better this way it's like we filmed a skit at matt best house a couple years back me logan matt noel his wife and uh i, I watched him creating building the board on it doing the edits mm-hmm. and stuff and it was just the same sound over and over and over and over again and i was like dude this is maddening i was like like how often like do you go back and watch finished videos he's like uh eh, maybe I'll, he's like i'll give it a year so he'll publish something and he won't watch it yeah for a year because it just it's maddening yeah you know and i don't either i don't we just put it out oh, well, when i first started doing podcasts about 10 years ago um the first one i did ever was the crossfit journal uh podcast when i was living in new york and um i remember man god i sound like an idiot god i fucked that up and you go back and you listen you're like yeah it sounded half bad it actually sounded pretty smart yeah and then like i just like i don't i don't listen to my own episodes sometimes i do very rarely but you know i just i have a hard time because i have to do some of my own editing yeah on the audio side and I'm like, God, why did I say that? But then I'm like, you know what? Fuck it. It's me. I'm just going to leave it in. Yeah. Who's, you know, yeah, like, I mean, is anyone really am I listening? trying to be, yeah. you anyone, know, is anyone really listening to me? You know? <laughs> yeah. And that's how you got to go about it. I think is you got to approach it. Like nobody's listening to this shit. Just mm. you and me having a conversation yeah. right now. I'll tell you a really good one is, um, is the uh, Mike force podcast with, uh, with, um, Mike Glover. Yeah. So I met Mike through Evan. Mike was a green beret Delta guy. Uh, owns Fieldcraft Survival. He's got a podcast now called Mike Force where he talks to just some of the just He's an incredible awesome guy. Awesome dudes. It's like 30, 35 minutes. Yeah. Uh, I, I listen to it when I ride my bike, my road bike. So I'll get on my bike, go ride for an hour, hour and a half, and I'll listen to one of his podcasts. And like, that's one of those Me things. Me and Jeremy where, both listen to it too. Yeah, he's so, great. Yeah, yeah. That's where I like I, my, my thing. He did one with um, the thing that really set me off on this leadership kick. He did an episode with um, Kyle Lim. Uh, who owns Viking Tactics. Kyle was a Delta Force guy, and he was in the Battle of Mogadishu. Uh, he's a sergeant major at the unit. And um, he was, Kyle was talking about leadership. And he said, um, and forgive me if I don't get this perfect, but the, his team leader like lost his best friend 
on the streets of Mogadishu that day, and they remember hearing it over the radio, like so and so KIA, and that was the team leader's like best friend in the world, best friend in the world, and everybody's like, oh my god, what now? Like our leader's best friend just got killed, and like I don't know if it was the first guy from the unit that died that day, but it was like a th- things were going to go two ways. The guy was going to freak out, but what the guy did was like, all right, guys, here's what we're going to do, and Kyle said like that's the most phenomenal display of leadership he's ever seen in his entire life like my best friend just got killed but we have a job to do and we're going to finish this mission and then i'll be upset but like that's when i was like all right that's what we're missing is leadership you know? yeah yeah that's where i got on that kick but mike force with mike glover's phenomenal one um black rifle just rebranded the free range american podcast the black rifle coffee podcast oh they did yeah um and if I would highly recommend any podcast that Evan Hafer is interviewing anybody on. It's just like, dude, it's so good. His command, his command of the English. I'm not trying to sound like this Evan Hafer kiss ass, but like, I, I don't, I'm not good at talking about myself. I'm really good at talking about my friends, you know? Yeah. And, um, that's another really, really good one. I'll tell you another great one. It's this one called in the red clay. It's, ab- it's about, that. um, Billy Saturday Burt and it's the Georgia mafia. Oh really? Dude, it is. It's told by his son. It is phenomenal. I started it and couldn't stop it. 13 episodes. In the Red Clay. It's about the Dixie Mafia in Georgia. And, dude, it is. Like, you like the movie Goodfellas or Casino and stuff? Uh Bro, you ain't seen shit. In the Red Clay. Give it a a listen. I definitely will. Yeah. What are, you know, on some of your hunting trips and being on all these different continents, what's the, do you have some crazy moments that have really stood out? Like, God, I almost died or, Um, you know. Depends on uh, who you damn, ask. Damn, I'm in a shitty situation. Or Depends on who you ask. Yeah. So I'm the guy, I'm going to drive 110 miles an hour until <laughs> I get a speeding ticket. Right. And once I get a speeding ticket, I got a notification for my calendar. That's the only thing I accept <laughs> notifications from. Um, I'm going to drive 110 until I get a speeding ticket, and then I'll never break the speed limit again. And, um, I mean, like, <laughs> lions and shit, uh, I remember Michael Howell running back to the blind to get a gun because we had a dead zebra and there was two lines in the area. And, like, Michael shot the zebra at 22 yards and it just went through both lungs and the heart. And I've never in my life... The bow? I've never seen this much blood come out of an animal in my life. I've ne- You've never seen anything like it. It was insane. And and the way the animal was... He spun a couple 360s when he, when he, as he expired and it just painted a ring. And we walked over there to look at it and then all of a sudden it's like, wait a minute, are there lines here now? Like, oh, my God, Michael sprints back in it. I just stood there. And um, he was like, I was like, what are you doing? He's like, man, lions. And I was like, yeah, you know, like, it'd make for a great story if it did. And I, yeah. I, and, and then, um, let's see, that happened. Oh, yeah, yeah, So <laughs> this is so great. That same trip, we're in this blind, and Michael really wanted a big kudo. It was our last hunt, last day, last sit. And all of a sudden, like, I just kind of looked behind me, and I, and the sun was, like, in my eyes, but I saw a glint in the, in the, in the, uh, in the bushes. And I was like, is that, is that a cootie behind us? He's like, oh, my God, I think it is. And so we sat there for 40, and my head was cranked, not moving. And I swear, I think to this day, I still have some type of, like, neck injury from cranking my head for 30 minutes. <laughs> and um, all of a sudden, he entered the, the water hole, and... Michael had to kind of hunch down to take the shot, and his arrow was, like, right beside my face. And he's, like, moving. I was, like, I'm not moving shit. I'm going to see. I'm going to watch this happen. So this arrow goes, and he had to, something happened, and he, Michael's a phenomenal bow shot. I, I've never seen Michael make a bad shot with a bow, actually. And he gut shot the shit out of him. And so we get out, and we walk down, and we find the arrow, and Michael's just beside himself. Because Michael was a professional baseball player. Like, Michael beats himself up when he's not perfect on mm-hmm. things. And I pulled Drees off to the side, and I was like, hey, man, like, what are the chances of finding this thing? He goes, if we can get Lady here, and Lady is the tracking dog, if we can get Lady here in 15 minutes, I think we can find it. I was like, Lady's 28 miles away. And these aren't paved roads. Somehow, they got Lady there in 16 minutes. Damn. I don't know how they got there that fast. I, I, I have no idea. And, this, and we're on a quarter of a million acre ranch. So what happens is when in Africa – and then remind me of the sable. That's an, oh, that's okay. another, fuck. That's another great story. And then Jamie and when Lady got killed. Um, so 
we normally what happens is when you find where an animal was was shot, you let the dogs. If you have blood, let them smell blood. If you have, but this was a gut shot. You know, all we had was a gut shot air that smelled like a butthole at a festival. Mm-hmm. You know how buttholes smell at festivals. <laughs> yeah. Shit, it's terrible. And so normally they kind of start following what trail they think it is, and they'll normally cut a track 50 yards in, mm-hmm. all right? And so you're kind of walking, and you're getting yourself prepared to take off. Lady cut a track about 10 yards, and we started sprinting. And so they're going, sook, sook, lady, sook, 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 and it's getting the dog fired up. And she's, like, ready to go. And she, we hear bay, not bay, but just cut it, just she, Burr! And so we take off running. And I'm talking about you're getting torn apart by thorns. Everything in Africa wants to kill you. Right. And we're sprinting through the bush, wide ass open. And because the lady's going to chase its gut shot, it's probably going to run away. So we take off running. We hear lady. And I'm running. I'm with another PH who's kind of overweight. And so all of a sudden, we hear lady behind us. And we're hunting over this lake. All right. And we were like, we all hit another gear. We are sprinting as fast as we possibly can through the bush. And I mean, like, flashbacks to college football days, max effort. And I went by that overweight pH and snatched a rifle out of his hand. And I entered this clearing. So, Dries and Michael went that way. We went another way. I entered this clearing back where the lake is, out of breath, breathing through my ears. Breathing through my ass, my ears, any <laughs> hole in my body that will accept oxygen, I'm sucking air in. I see the kudu in the middle of the lake. I see Lady on the bank going crazy. And I look to my left, and Michael and Dries are right there, and, and Dries goes, shoot it in the shoulder. Michael pulls up Dries' rifle and shoots it in the shoulder. The moment the rifle snaps off, Lady jumps in the water and starts swimming out to this kudu that's going crazy. And she starts attacking it. And the next thing I know, she's on top of a kudu in a lake going crazy on the arrow, uh, the, the gunshot wound. And so I ended up swimming out into that lake and swimming that kudu back to shore with Drees. That was an epic shot. You're fucking animal, dude. <laughs> well, and Michael's like, what are you doing? I was like, if you think I'm missing this experience, you're right. insane, dude. I'm going out there. You know, so. What's in the water there? They're crocs? They're fucking. Life, things that will kill you. Yeah. Um, Another epic story from Africa. Is this the Sable story? So okay. it took Todd, founder of Killcliff. Todd was a SEAL. Todd is a horrible rifle shot. He actually scoped himself on this trip. Anyway, um, he's left-handed. He's weird. We- left-handed people are weirdos. Um, so first day, he's like, I want a Sable. And I was like, all right, well, you're definitely going to see a Sable. He fell asleep. So like, we get there, and Todd, like the first night, Todd slept the whole flight over there, which was like 15 hours. We get there. And then we, you're four hours, five hours to the camp. And then you get to the camp at like 10, 11 PM. And like Todd slept for like 13 hours at night. Like he slept like 27 hours the first like 36 hours. It's crazy. And we're sitting in this blind and he felt falls asleep. And I remember I reached over and I was like, where's an hour? I hadn't seen an animal and that's rare. And I was like, oh my God, like I promised him, like there's no guarantees, but like I guaranteed him a sable first day. Um, and I reached over and touched his leg and I went, sable. He goes, yeah, yeah, I want to shoot one. I was like, no dude, there's one right there. So... It comes in at 19 yards broadside, and I don't know what happened. He's a good. He's a pretty good shot with his bow. He just learned to shoot, but he was, you know, he was good. He shot it in the back, in no man's land, where there was the no back hind quarter or something. No, no, yeah. no, like below the spine in the back where there's oh, not, there's nothing there. Yeah, and so it trots off, and I'm like thinking, that's a thirteen thousand dollar animal. Holy shit. What the fuck, man? And I looked at Dries and he looked at me. And Todd's like, I think I fly like, oh, the sable sneezed right before he shot. And he j- 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 jumped his shot. It was funny. So I'm like, oh, my God, oh, my God, oh, my God, oh, my God. What are we going to do? And so I remember that he calls a bring lady. And so we go to where he shot. Lady takes off running. And all of a sudden, all hell breaks loose about 100 yards away. And so we go sprinting over there, and Lady has this sable is latched onto its testicles. <laughs> you know how you swing a kid around like in a 360? It was yeah. swinging Lady by its balls, swinging oh it God. in circles, trying to hook it with its horns. And um, that was an experience. Um, my The giraffe I shot was pretty badass, too. That was, um, we were, we spotted this 
massive old bull giraffe and we stalked in and like i'm not scared i don't get scared because not because i'm like super tough it's just more of like a stupidity thing you know mm-hmm. and i just remember 40 yards from this draft and it's facing us and i thought i was with my buddy brian weed and two trackers and Drees. was and that I, with your bow no it was with okay. a 400 nitro express yeah I was gonna double say. gun 500 grain bullet and i just remember thinking if this thing charges like what the fuck do i do and i looked to my right about 50 yards from my right there was like a little tr- like a banyan tree maybe 10 feet tall and to my left, about six seventy-five yards, there was another one. It's about fourteen feet tall. I was like, "Well, I'm gonna kick Brian in his, and I'm gonna trip him, and then I'm gonna run to one of those trees." And so we were gonna double up on this draft. And so he shot it with a three seventy-five H and H, like right in the chest, and it took went to take off running. I stepped around from behind him and just drilled it, and it dropped like a sack of potatoes. And really? everyone turned around and looked at me because that that doesn't happen with giraffe. You don't. No mm-hmm. one drops giraffe. They run. doesn't matter what you put in them. But I got lucky and made the perfect shot, and it dropped like a sack of potatoes. Wow. That was epic. What's Those, your aim? I mean, you got to be aiming like you're shooting a bird almost, 40, right? No, it was 40 yards, yeah. so I hit it in the okay. heart, the heart, right perfectly yeah. in the heart, right on the star, right on the shoulder. Mm-hmm. That was epic. Um, I got charged by a few pigs in Australia. I, I Where I hunted in Australia, I stayed at um, Aboriginal Village. Like, you've seen the movie Snatch? Mm-hmm. You know the the gypsy campsite. Yeah, that's where I stayed, but way dirtier. <laughs> yeah, for that was that was pretty epic. Australia is weird. That's more shooting than hunting. It's not really complicated. Yeah, um, yeah I mean, I, I no, there's I so many crazy experiences. Yeah, we could go on forever about. Yeah, this. but like yeah. nothing like where I really ever thought I was gonna die. Okay. Like, um, I guess I'm smart enough to not put myself in those situations. I'm sure that I've had near death experiences and didn't realize it. You know, um, but I've never had any bear encounters, none of that stuff. Yeah. Uh, you know, like I've never been like hypothermic or you know, always. I'm pr- always pretty prepared. I'm always like I, I. I would say that I'm. I have a level of confidence in my abilities to survive. I would say, mm-hmm. um, and like I'm. I'm pretty prepared when I go out into the back country in the woods and stuff. Like you know, you um, have to be. Yeah, but I just. I, I guess it's extent. just like a. Like I said, I've probably been in some hairy situations that I didn't realize were that hairy. Mm-hmm. Um, but I've 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 got a pretty good head on my shoulders about that stuff. And like I don't I don't seek out near death experiences. You know what I mean? Like I don't right. like with that zebra. It's like Michael's freaking out about lions. It's like yeah, I mean, what are the chances of a lion coming in here with three dudes standing? Around? Like I mean, like what? No, I mean, come on. Um, n- yeah, none of that stuff. It, hunting to me is fun. Like I I. I I, I really enjoy it because I find myself in situations where I'm really cold or really wet or really tired and my feet hurt and things like that. And like when my feet start hurting, I'll think about my buddy Crispy. He's missing a leg. He's not complaining about his feet. I have two feet or Derek Carver, you know, yep. or Clint or, or Clint trial who has no feet or Jonathan blank who doesn't have any feet double, you know, bilateral amputees. Mm-hmm. And it's like, what would those guys give to be able to stand where I'm standing right now? Is that one of the reasons why you started like the Hunter Recruitment Project and well, um, Adaptive Shooter and so all the cool stuff that you guys the do? The Adaptive thing, that's Evan Hafer and mm-hmm. um, and Tom Davin and Logan. That's I just They came up with that concept, and I just helped with that tremendously. Like I put a lot of energy into that. Not Nowhere near what those guys do. Without them, it wouldn't go off. Mm-hmm. I just I helped to make it better. That's my thing is like I, I'm, I make assets perform better. You know, like you, you, you got a Ferrari – like, I'm going to put super expensive gasoline in it. You know what I mean? Right. Um, and then the Hunter Recruitment Project, we came up with that concept because we got this 2,500-acre farm, 2, farm in America's Georgia. And going back to buck-to-doe ratio, you have to harvest a ton of does. And I've killed hundreds of deer, you know, in my mm-hmm. life. Like, shooting a doe, for me, like, it's like I am doing it for, for, for herd management. Well, for, it's herd management. It's not conservation. Like a, a lot of people use that word. I don't. I've never gone into the woods to conserve. I've gone into the woods to kill animals. That's why I do it. Um, I spend money, and a portion of all the money I spend goes to conservation. And like I, we improve the property. And like, uh, yes, but me in the woods is killing. It's not conserving. And a lot of people use that because they want to, kind of. They think it's like a little bulletproof vest that someone that if someone hears them use that word, they won't be offended. I don't give a shit. Like that's not what I'm doing. I'm, 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 I hunt. Yeah. It's a blood sport. Um, but we started with the hunter recruitment project because it's like, you know, I want to give people an opportunity to um, 
to successfully go out into the woods and kill a deer. I'm not going to guarantee you that you're going to like it. And I'm not going to guarantee you're going to have fun. And I'm not going to guarantee it's going to be easy. It's not going to be hard. You might have to sit in a stand for a couple of days. Like Nicole, uh, Tears' girlfriend, she, had to, she, she was the, like 11th and a half hour. It was raining and she was getting frustrated. And I'm like, please, God, like, just give me like, and she, she was like, st- not stomping around, but you could tell she was getting antsy and she was mm-hmm. getting pissed and like just everyone else had killed one to two deer. And here she was, you know, three days in, hadn't shot shit. And it was raining. Sun's going down. It's getting dark. And uh, sun stopped, rain stopped for a second and went deer. And there was a deer. Picked her up. And I told her, I was like, hey, man, listen, like this thing can change in a split second. You can go from zero to hero real fast yeah. and vice versa. But what we wanted to do was like teach. Like I think if 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 you want to try something new, the greatest thing there's two things in the world that can happen. Like I want to start a business. You need one person to say, "Hey, man, I, I'm I'm going to go with you. I'll, I'll help you. Mm-hmm. I believe in what you're doing. I think it'll work." That's huge in business. But like when you're learning a new skill or something like that, like just a little bit of success early goes a long way. A ton. Yeah. It, it, it's super important. So it's like we're going to go to a farm in Georgia. And where we, 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 we manage the land for agriculture and timber, and then deer is third. Deer might be second, actually. Um, and we have feeders because we supplement their food source, and we, we do protein enhancement, and we do corn. And you're gonna sh- we're going to sit in a stand near a feeder, and hopefully some does will come out of that feeder, and you're going to shoot one. And then you're going to gut it, and you're going to take meat home with you. And that's success. It's not hard. But yep. it's success. Now, you can learn a lot about yourself when you pull the trigger on a deer and you kill it. And you have to walk up and there's this, especially if you don't make a clean shot, like it falls down. For and, me, it puts a value on life, too. I yeah. Think. Like, yeah. If people, like, yeah. Nicole shot her deer, dropped it at 160 yards, and then it flopped around for a little bit, you know, 30 seconds. And it's like, can you handle that? Mm-hmm. You know? So that's, and then that's, so last year we took 18 people hunting for, that had never been. They killed their first deer. Some of them killed two. They took venison home, um, and we taught them how to shoot a rifle, how to zero a rifle, and wind and all that stuff. And then they now they have some success. A build they've got a they, we 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 started the puzzle. They have a foundation. We we started the puzzle. We we mm-hmm. built the border of the puzzle. It's up to them to fill the inside in, and it's been a great success. We've got our first one coming up, uh, hunting one in October, which is we're taking a we've got a vegan ultra runner, we've got two riders for coffee or die, um, and a few other people and so it'll be it's gonna be fun i'm really excited about that Hell i yeah. can't wait so that's yeah awesome. that's the main thing with that it's just like do i get anything out of shooting a bunch of you know does each year or mm-hmm. would i get more out of letting someone else do it and we're we're you know like i've taken a ton of people to africa with me and like to sit in a, and i've been a bunch and to sit in a blind with a bow in africa on a water hole and you see someone's face light up when they see their first wild african animal and they're like, what is that? And you're like, that's an Impala. Can I shoot it? Well, yeah, but maybe wait and see if another <laughs> one comes in. Right. You know, big, that's a, that's, a, that's a small Impala. And then two days later, they've seen 400 Impala, and it's not the same reaction. But that initial reaction is priceless. Or they see a sable, or they see a Cape Buffalo. Mm-hmm. And you see a Cape Buffalo, and you're like, are we safe in here? Yeah. Because a Cape Buffalo looks at you like you owe it a shitload of money. Yeah. And you're behind, <laughs> you know? So... um, yeah, the Hunter Recruitment Project's been a resounding success. We've got Black Rifle is the title sponsor of it, and Everly Stock is our presenting sponsor. Leupold helps out. Uh, Wrighton helps out. Um, Mountain Primal, Eastman's Hunting Journals. I mean, it's it's just it's, That's great, it's, it's man. awesome. Man. It's what a, a great ton of program. Fun. It's a ton of fun. It really is. You know, before we uh, before you and I met, we had some mutual friends. Nicole was one of them, actually. Mm-hmm. Like she was helped share the podcast. You know, yep. as it started going and. Um, you and I have never really talked about this, but how did you hear about us? Like, I don't, we've just kind of hit it off. So and- that goes back to like planting seeds. Mm-hmm. So I knew that I was going to ask Evan to let me be in charge of hunting for black rifle. And so I started kind of priming the pump and I thought, all right. And, in, in the, the book, uh, it's, it's, I've always heard like, if you control the air, you own everything. You know, and the book Lines at the Gate, the Six Day War with Israel in the 60s, like that's what they did when it kicked off. They destroyed everyone's fucking Air Force. Destroyed 
the whole air force of their of their enemies. So they're the only one that had air. And so I started thinking like, I want to get a list of podcasts and those podcasts I'm going to get on those podcasts. I'm going to put my friends that are associated with Black Rifle and other companies I work with on the podcast. Which I want to thank you for publicly because you've you've introduced me to some people that we've had on the show first off or made the introductions. Mm -hmm. And those people have become friends now. Yeah. Like Luke Peelgrain and John Luke's Moss. Awesome. And John's those great. guys are awesome, man. Yeah. I, and we've gone on to do other stuff yeah. since we recorded, you know? So, so what I started doing was just like, uh, you just, you kind of, I started asking people about Western podcasts. Yeah. You called me like on a Saturday morning or yeah, something. Yeah. I was like, <laughs> and I just started sending people messages like, mm -hmm. hey, man, you know, I work with Black Rifle. I'd love to do a podcast with you. And so what I was doing is I was basically interviewing podcasts as well. And so I would go and I'd do a podcast or I would know someone that did a podcast and I would be like, are these people worth a shit? Is this show any good? Does this person know what they're talking did about? Did we make the cut? Yeah, that's why I'm here. So what I, um, that's, I just started doing that. I started creating a list of podcasts. And so I've, I think I've got probably 30 podcasts on that list now and some are good. Some are, you know, not good. Um, and some, I don't make introductions. Others I do make introductions to. And that's just kind of how I evaluate stuff. Yeah. So I do that with, I mean, like I do that with a lot of things in business. Like, like it's a, it's like, a, it's like a live fire drill. Like I'm interviewing you just like you're interviewing me, mm -hmm. but I'm interviewing you before you interview me. Cause then I can tell, I, 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 I can tell really quickly if someone's a shithead. Right. Or if there's someone like the main thing for me is you might be tiny. I knew the moment that i met you that i liked you because there was no bullshit it was that, just like hey that, this is what's going on what are your downloads how does this work dude, and it rubs so and, many people the wrong way really it, yeah, oh my god i yeah the, people i mean it was going off there's a question in the back of my head like what is what does this baker want no and then that's whatever and then i didn't really give a shit after i talked to you the no, second time everyone I was like, everyone thinks that john dudley and i like we didn't really get along for years because he thought that i was out for, to get something out of him and it's not like I, I am constantly I do a lot of stuff for people. If you make the cut with me, I will do anything for you yeah. because a rising tide raises all ships. And that's just how I've been my whole life. So like if I like someone or I can like so, for example, like with Dudley, like I've introduced Dudley to a couple brands because it just makes sense. Mm -hmm. I don't need anything out of it. But it's like, you know, Dudley, you should be talking to these guys or like, you know, um, I'll talk to a company. I'm like, hey, like, or they'll mention his name. And so for years, like, I'd reach out, like, hey, man, I just talked to so and so. Like, they're huge fans of yours, man. Like, they're big fans. And I mean, a lot, if I'm John Dudley and some dude that does a lot of stuff like me is constantly like trying to introduce him to brands, or not constantly, but like from time to time tries to introduce him to brands, I'm like, what is this guy's angle? Why right. is he working for me for free? And so what, what's, what people don't understand about me is that. If, if you're on my team, if, if I deem you as a teammate, I'm going to do stuff for you. I don't need anything out of it. Yeah. Like John works with Mountain Primal. John Dudley works with Mountain mm -hmm. Primal. That's great. John Moss is a dear, dear friend of mine. Yeah. Dudley is a very good friend of mine. Why, he, John Dudley cooks on a Traeger all the fucking time. Why, would, why the fuck is he, Why are you guys not working together? Like, what's going on? Yeah. And so in my mind, the reward for me is two plus two is four. I got that, I got that math problem right. And that's the way my brain works. But a lot of people like it, like Aaron Snyder, same thing. I think yeah. for years, Aaron was like, this guy wants something. Mm -hmm. and, that, and, that, and, there's and I get that mentality because I've had that mentality my whole career, right. you know, in music and everything, you know, it's just like, oh yeah, dude, you I, help people, you know, the more you help people, you're only as strong as the people that hold you up, in yeah, my so opinion. I've been burned so many times mm -hmm. by, Me too. by all kinds <laughs> of stuff, yeah. but I don't dwell on it. Yeah. It's like learn and move on. And I'll make the same mistake in, in that situation, helping people. I'll make the mistake again, but I don't care because I'm doing the right thing. I'm trying mm -hmm. to help somebody, you know? And so, like, Aaron Snyder was the same way. He would tell you for years he thought that, like, I was, like, trying to get something from him. Mm -hmm. But I was just introducing him to brands that I thought that he would fit in well. Like, I'll right. talk to so-and-so. Like, I was on the phone, on the, on the phone call um, several times this past week. What's today? Month? Last week with a, with a brand. And they kept talking about Dudley. And I was like, yeah, man, he's a really good friend of mine. Like, let me see if he wants to talk to you. And so now it's like I can just shoot him a text like, hey, dude, like these guys were right. They're, they're super fans of yours. I think 
your brand, I think knock on fits well with them. But one thing I tell people about Dudley, it's like, Hey man, like, um, he's the best. And I work with a ton of influencers. And the reason that Dudley is the best is because one, he's an adult. He's like, he's, he's our age and he's been a professional for making money, working as an adult, supporting himself since he was 20. And he knows what he's doing. Mm-hmm. And he's the guy, like, you never, the one thing that sucks, and if you're an influencer or you want to be an influencer and you're listening to this podcast, the worst fucking thing in the world is when the company you work with has to worry about if you're doing your job or not. It sucks. Right. You have to go behind and look at because what a lot of influencers do, it's that honeymoon period. Oh, I want a sponsor. Or I've got 75,000 Instagram followers. I'm important. Well, one, you're not because that ain't shit. <laughs> it's nothing. That 75,000, yeah. 100,000 is nothing. Um, and they want to, so they get a couple sponsors and they see how the game works and they want to get more sponsors. They want to get paid, you know, whatever. So they'll chase a sponsor and they will do, they'll, they will be the best influencer in the world trying to get the contract. Once they get the contract, yeah. they're off chasing the next sponsor. That's not how Dudley works. Dudley, Dudley actually, there are times when he does too much. Mm-hmm. And in my head, I'm like, he should back off a little bit. You know, not. Well, I got to talk to you off the air because I haven't asked for one. They just keep showing up. Yeah, so but, so, it's like, but what? So, but the thing with Dudley is like, you don't have to worry about what he's doing. He knows his brand. He knows his audience, and he knows how to communicate with his audience. And it, the way he does things, it works for his audience and his brand. And if you're if you're a company that fits in with that, then I think you should be working with him. Yeah. And I've introduced him to I think, I think five brands now. I think four he has a. An official contract with and I think the fifth one so he had, so uh, Mike um, Mike Mike Looper he came from Hoyt um, not Lampers Mike his name is Mike Looper he came from Hoyt I think I'm pretty or maybe PSC um, and he's now the president of knock on and I know that Dudley is elk hunting and I'm not gonna bother him with a company that wants to talk to him so I reached out to Mike I was like hey dude I just talked to this brand um, I kind of explained to him how Dudley is and what has worked in the past. And if you would like me, here's a little bit of information on him. If you want me to make the introduction, let me know and I'll do it. Because Dudley's on my team. So I'm going to help my teammates. And I don't need anything in the world other than common courtesy. If I have a question or I reach out to you, you respond. And yeah. Dud- Dudley is awesome about that. But I'm also, that's another thing. Like I hang around and run in a circle with a lot of very, um, let's just say famous people successful people that are out there they put themselves out there they have these phenomenal podcasts and like you know phenomenal companies they own and they've started in these amazing military careers i don't fanboy them and i don't blow them up like i pick my shots with them like it is the most important communication of the day for me evan hafer ceo of a billion dollar company Mm -hmm. does he give a fuck about this funny meme am i going to text him a meme or some stupid thing that AOC said no because I want Evan to know that when I reach out to him it's important right I've thought it through and I get I think I can honestly say I think aside from his partners I think I'm one of the only people that Evan responds to everything I send him but I'm very picky about what I send him same with Dudley like you know like hey man congrats on that fucking outfit that makes a lot of sense yeah Yeah. so and that's another thing like I, I would advice I would give people is like be super strategic in your communications okay like People are busy and like be considerate of other people's time and just your communication. Like just Evan Hafer makes a hundred, 250 decisions that affect the employment and the future of 550 employees of his company. So I have to think about that when I send him that. Okay. Or Dudley, like, when someone like that that's like an upper echelon dude reaches out to me and they ask me to do something I don't give a fuck what I'm doing I'm going to stop what the fuck I'm doing and I'm going to do it because it's important for them to know that when they need me I am there for them I don't reach out to them with stuff I don't like mm-hmm. hey like, but 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 when I do the day's going to come when I'm going to need some help something or I'm going to need an introduction or I'm going to need something or I'm going to ask for a favor. I want the answer to be yes. And the way that you do that is by picking and choosing the things that are important and never crying wolf. Yep. You know, like that's super important. You know, like with the New York Times article, 
I run the Twitter. That's where all this fucking shit was coming. I talked to Evan three times a day on that. And I told him, I was like, hey, man, I got this. Don't go on Twitter. Don't read anything. And if something's fucking important, you'll be the first to know. Right. And he trusts me now to know. And he'll check in, like, how's it going? I'm like, yeah, same old just anonymous bots talking shit. Don't worry about it, man. Mm-hmm. I got it. I'll let you know if something important happens. So, and that, and that, that's, that's, that's a really good feeling to know that there are people that trust you with certain, and I run Evan's Twitter, I run Matt, I run Matt's Twitter. Like, yeah. to know that those guys trust me to communicate on their behalf on that platform, that's important. Makes a lot of sense. I mean, that's just, a, that's a smart relationship building block, I think. Yeah. Yeah. So, like, talking about Dudley again, like, so the brand, I'm, the company I was talking to, like. You better tag him in this episode. <laughs> oh, I will. Oh, well. The company I was talking to, like, he, he's, he's, Nate, he's like 30 years old. And he's like super excited. He thinks I'm like this super cool guy. And it's like, I'm not that important, Nate. Like, I like to help create the news. I am, I don't ever want to be the news. Like, that is my mantra. Like, help create the news. Don't be the news. And like, he's like, oh, Dudley, this, not that. And I was like, listen, man, like, these dudes are all super normal people, man. They're, they're like, they're super normal. And like, I've seen them like when they've been down or pissed or upset or worrying about things that I was like, man, why, are you, why are you worrying about this silly shit? But I was like, listen, what is the, what is the goal here? You guys want to work with him. You don't want to be his friend. It's for you. You're trying to use him to help elevate your brand. Okay. And that's, that's the goal is ele- brand elevation through engagement with a known commodity in that space that will help you get eyeballs from new and upcoming hunters on your product. That's important. So if I do make this introduction, your goal is to say as few fucking words to him as possible. He knows what to do. He doesn't need any advice from you. You're 30. He's 43. So when you, if and when that comes, and I was like, this introduction might not be for two or three weeks, but I'm going to tell you this every time I talk to you. Shut the fuck up and listen. The goal, he who speaks first loses. Hi, Mr. Dudley. We think you're awesome. We want to work with you. Here's how our product works. Here's what we want to, here's what we're willing to do. We'll pay you X and then we want this as well. Shut the fuck up. He knows what to do. Mm-hmm. He's a pro. Let him do the, just be like, hey, whatever you, you tell us. And what, that's why you're paying him. Yeah. Like what <laughs> yeah, makes, let him do what, his job. what, and that's, and that's just not for yeah. Dudley. I'm just using him yeah. as an example because he's a recent example. Sure. Um, I'm not trying to put his business out there, but like a guy like that, that's established, they know what to do, you know, like they don't want like some 30 year old texting them shit all day long. They're busy. They're, he's running a big company and he's, he's the face of a big brand. He's out in the field. He's away from his office, away from home. So like when you get a chance to I- interact with him, miss, we're, we're, we're huge fans. Make it easy for him. Like make it super easy. Like people will tell me all the time. They're like, Hey man, like, you could sell ice to Eskimos. Well, that's just not true. Ice, Eskimos don't need ice. But I can sell them fire at a better price faster than anyone in the world. Sure. Because, and it's, it's, all, it's all about consideration. Like, my mother called me inconsiderate one time, and I swore I would never, ever be called inconsiderate by another person as long as I live. Because it but, but still bothers me. And it was, dude, that was 20 years ago. It still bothers me. And, um, they, like, be considerate of other people's time. Like, and I, I, like, I ride a road bike a lot. I have shaved legs. I'm 235 pounds with shaved legs. I'm 5'10", I'm a pretty stocky guy, but I ride a road bike a lot. And the reason I ride a road bike a lot is because I have fights and arguments in my head with people, and I have conversations with people. And it's very rare that I will go into a negotiation or a conversation with someone where I haven't already had the conversation with them. And no matter what they say, I've already it's gone through my head. So I, 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 and sometimes I cut people off because I know what they're going to say and I, I want to, well, here's my answer. So that's another, another piece of advice I always give people is like, when you don't just go into things half cocked, like have conversations, you know, like the thing with leadership, I was, I, I've been talking out loud in my car today, riding around Denver and all these talking points, like I've, like what we're talking, like I've already had, we've already been interviewed. Right. I, I, you've interviewed me earlier today in my head. So like that's another thing I do. Like is I just the, I did the same thing before I have yeah. a guest come in. Like so I I have a tattoo on my on the inside of my left forearm, and it's it would look like R cube to someone. And what this is is it's Euclidean math space. So it's three dimensional math. And the reason I have this is because this is 
one of the best pieces of advice I can give you. When you make a decision, think about how does that decision affect the people above you? How does it affect the people below you? How does it affect the future? And can that decision alter the past? Because I think the past is still being written. All right. So it's second, third and fourth order effects. All right. Like, let's say you and I have words and I walk over there and I punch you in your mouth and you, in your nose, you don't expect it or I knock you out. Yeah, I won. You got a pretty big friend sitting out here outside that I got to get by him too. And then, then what happens? Like, or, or like, that was a horrible example, but it's, yeah, it, think you're, I think, get what you're saying. Think, though, think yeah. through things. Like, for example, um, I can't talk shit on the internet to people or I can't call people out. Like, I can, I can, give examples of, of, of things on like my Instagram where I think people are doing stupid shit, but like, I can't like, like during the New York times article, New York times article, there was a bunch of fallout. There's a handful of journalists that if I ever see them, I might submit my resignation to black rifle coffee and go punch them. That's how mad I am at them. But like, think about this. So like if I were to go up and slap one of these journalists that was talking shit about us, would I feel better? Yeah. Would they probably regret talking shit? Probably so. Then what happens? Evan Hafer and Black Rifle might get sued. They have a bunch of bullshit. They have fu- they, then I become a distraction. So you don't ever want to be a distraction. So think about things. Like there's a, um, hold on. There's a hunting apparel company and the founder built his brand off of some bullshit. I can't run around screaming that because then what happens? Like, it becomes a distraction. Someone might call Evan. Someone might call Matt. Might call Logan. They might get tagged in a post, and then I drum up bullshit. So that's a, that's that's like when you make decisions, think about how those decisions will play out. It's like chess. And I think a lot of people just fired off these days. You yeah, know? because it's like it's so easy to do. The Outrage Olympics. They for, like what were you mad about yesterday, man? I don't remember. But let me tell you what I'm mad as fuck about today. You know <laughs> right. what were you mad about two days ago? I don't remember. <laughs> man, you were bitching like hell about something. Yeah. But like think about the decisions that you make. And what's the long-term effect? What happens? Like, are you going to do something for instantaneous grat- gratification? Or do you want, like, do you want, do you want 30-day money or do you want three-year money? Mm-hmm. Like, ask yourself that. Like, like, okay, like, guys that drive really big-ass trucks and have, like, jobs that they, they, they let's say they, they might have a small house and a mortgage, and then, but they spend most of their money on their truck. That's fucking stupid. That's fucking stupid. You don't need that. It's that, like think about that instantaneous gratification. Driving around a big gas guzzling truck. What 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 could you do with that money today, for the next twelve months or four years or three years, however long you have a mortgage? Like what else could you do with that? What could that do? How could that make your life better in the future? Yeah. You know. So, and I've learned that the hard way. Like I, dude, I used to drive Range Rovers. I had two brand new Range Rovers, and I bought my first one in two thousand and five. I bought a brand new one in late 2007 yep. stupid stupid oh i made stupid, stupid decisions when i was younger and what am i driving now a 2004 toyota tundra you know and which that's, will last that's another, what i want will last another yeah. 20 years you know? and i don't want a new truck yeah. now it's yeah. like yeah so like yeah you, like second third fourth order effects yeah think about how your decisions today will affect the future you know and it's like you don't want to be a distraction like and you you, you don't you don't ever want to be special. Like no, none of us are special. Like don't be special. Do your job. Do mm-hmm. it really, really well. Don't ever try to h- take credit for anything. So like, that's another thing. Like, and don't expect credit. Yeah, I don't ask for credit yeah. ever. Like, there, you'll never hear me. Well, I think I've given two examples where I did something epic in my life, and I'll take <laughs> I'll take credit for things. But like, I tell people all the time, it's like Black Rifle. Those guys were all mill guys that started, and they're all in the spec ops community. Those guys don't run around patting each other on the back. You don't get congratulations for doing your fucking job. So don't expect that. Accomplishing the mission is way more satisfying than someone patting you on the back for coming up with a good idea. Right. Great idea. Can you execute it? Can you, can you start a process and finish it? So that's like if you go to the CIA. So if you're a Mormon Eagle Scout that went to Yale Law School, you can... They, they will hire you instantaneously. And you know, you know why? Eagle Scout, what is that? Shows a person was, was willing to start a challenging task at an early age and finish it at a young age. Mormons, 
They go on missions. They knock on doors. They get told to fuck off a hundred times a day. But they buy into something and they believe in it. And for two years, they're in a foreign country away from their family. They get to talk to their mother on Christmas and their birthday. They're, and they get to talk to their mother on Christmas, family on Christmas, and their mother's birthday. They're gone for two years. And they get told, fuck you, a hundred times a day. And mo- usually in a foreign country. But they stay, they, they, they finish the mission. All right? Um, going to college. I'm going to start something and I'm going to finish it. Yale Law School. I'm going to continue doing hard things. So not not just Yale Law School, but like when you look at people like that, like there's, you know, you hear stories of guys that dropped out of college and all that stuff. And that's like a college degree doesn't really mean shit. It just, to me, it's like, oh, you you started and you finished. You finished. I don't give a fuck about it. You know, I don't care. I don't care where you went to. Well, I do care if you went to like I, I, my thing. Like, I don't look at resumes is like I try to find common ground. And if I like the person, we'll hire them. That's all that is. It's like, and then I'll try and like football. Oh, you went to SEC school. Oh, fuck yeah. I went to Georgia. You guys any good at, you know, like I I like trying to find common ground. So, um, yeah, it's been a wild ride, man. Like I'm 45, like I couldn't be happier. Everything's great, dude. Melissa, my girlfriend, phenomenal, amazing. Couldn't like I, I was talking to my buddy, Michael, and, um, he, he has the same thing with his girlfriend. It's like, he was like, Bree, do you ever like get sick of me? And she's like, no. And I was on the phone. I was, I was like, hey, Melissa. I was like, do you ever like get sick of me? <laughs> she's like, no, not at all. Why? Like, you don't ever like get sick of me being around? She's like, no, never. And I was like, what the fuck is wrong with you? You're the only person on this planet that will say that. Like, they don't ever get sick of me. Like, right. I, 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 like I could not, I could never in my life draw something I'm more physically attracted to or a person that her strengths are my weaknesses and my strengths are her weaknesses. It's it's a match made in heaven. It is a match made in heaven. And like you go on my Instagram, you'll see pictures of her, and you're like, that that's your girlfriend? Like you guys are, yeah, yeah, that's her. Yeah, pull it up. Uh, pull up yeah. Black Baker on Instagram. There it is. Third one. There you go. There you go. Yeah, look at her. My God, yeah, she's ripped, man. Yeah, go to the one. Oh, there's another one. Go down. There you go, right there. Good for you, man. Look at smoke hammer, smoke hammer, yeah. smoke hammer. Thinks I'm the coolest thing in the world, and doesn't get sick of you. No, Swinging which, out of your yeah. league, man. Which is I'm punching <laughs> up. Du- I'm punching dudes I'm, in this room doing I'm, that. Is I'm uh, punching out above my weight class. Is yep, what it is, man. That's what it is. But yeah, everything's great. We live in Florida, Ormond Beach. Um, just love it down there i'm never leaving small beach town there's no bullshit there's no drama um, hell yeah life's easy we're three miles from the beach and then we have a house on the other side of the state in steen hatchy where we go fishing and scalloping and all that stuff keep our boat over there yeah life's good no complaints man that's fucking great man what's uh what's next for you what do you got you got any big hunts coming up i know you're going on the mule deer hunt you said you're coming here to do elk right yeah, I'm at, well so so dudley and logan just killed big elk like and logan killed big elk this morning in Utah, Dudley shot um, a monster. I think it was like two days ago. Um, and I haven't been thinking about my elk hunt at all until I saw those photos, and it just everything just clicked. Are elk one of your favorite, man? Because that's like that's what I live for. Um, honestly, so I I shoot one elk every fall, and um, I don't do more than that. I just do that. Do I do one mm-hmm. bull elk? If you scroll down, you'll see my elk from my New Mexico bull last year. There he is. Jocko. <laughs> yeah. So that's my New Mexico. Old nice. bull. He's been shot before. Um, old, old bull. Busted off a couple points. Like, scroll. Hit the next picture. Like, on the collage. No, no. No, go back. There you go. Yeah, that was awesome. That's cool. Man, that's, um, that's beautiful. I lost that hat somewhere. I'd give anything in the world to find it. <laughs> God, I want that hat back. So he had good width. It's great. But um, I don't want to spoil that for me. So every year I'll go shoot one good bull. And that, because normally the way I do things is like I start something and I just become a psychopath and I'm obsessed with it. I don't want to burn out from elk hunting. I'm going to do one every year, one quality, quality. Elk. This year I'm going to the Hall Ranch with the Eastmans. Um, Look at the Jocko Willink picture. <laughs> <laughs> that's 
That's I mean, hilarious. That's just so fantastic. <laughs> yeah. If you don't wake up at four thirty eight every morning, yeah. that's what you'll turn into. <laughs> but um, yeah. So I, I've got that, and then um, we've got some hunter recruitment events. I've got um. I don't plan stuff out that yeah. far in advance. I'm going to go to Africa this coming summer. I'm going to take a bunch of guys over there. Um, and uh, let's see. What else do I have? Mule deer. Uh, a bunch of whitetail stuff. Um, I'll go to Texas and shoot another Axis just because the meat is so phenomenal. Um, so I've got whitetail in Texas. I've got Axis in Texas this this winter. Uh, that'll probably be in December. I've got um, the last week of September I have – elk at the hall ranch tomorrow i leave for curtis nebraska um and then i've got some epic duck hunts coming up this winter um so yeah dude i'm it's gonna be a great year that's great yeah man thank you so much dude mm-hmm. we've burned through two hours i know oh, you wow. gotta go do another podcast here like yeah luke. are you late no okay cool all care. right <laughs> it's just luke it's yeah. yeah we love luke man we've yeah. uh, <laughs> we've both been on each other's and he's a great dude fun dude to hang out yeah, with he's awesome real quick before we jump off uh, can you tell the listeners what Black Rifle's doing for Mountainside listeners? Right oh, now? Yeah. yeah. So we, we have a discount code, 20% off. Uh, the, Which is fucking, that's a big discount. Yeah, that's yeah, awesome. That's great. So the code is Mountainside. Yep. Mountainside, 20% All one off. All word. Yep. yep. 20% off. Um, go check it out. Yeah. Thanks Get some for good listening. coffee, man. Yeah. I was just up drinking at Elk Hunt and doing the pour over. It's so great. I don't yeah, do the pour overs, man. Really? I, it, I it, dig it. Yeah. I, it, it like, it's just it's too much. Yeah, too much. What, I don't do you put the, it in a coffee machine or what? So uh, I, I French press. Oh, okay. Or when I'm when I'm hunting, like I do instant. The yeah. instant. The in, uh, listen, I like those. Uh, what are those? The steam bags or steep, what you, steep bags? Steep bags. Yeah. yeah. Our instant coffee is the best instant coffee in the world. It is fucking awesome. Yeah. yeah. I'm a huge the fan little of it. packets. Mm-hmm. Yeah. The one sticks. Yeah. Yeah. Those are awesome too. So yeah, super pumped. Thanks for having me, dude. Great conversation. Yeah. Thanks for coming out. You're welcome yeah. back anytime, man. Yeah. Anytime that you're in the area, please hit us up. Let me know, and I'll come after we'll my be elk hunt. I'll come after my elk hunt. Do a follow up on that. That'd be great, man. Yeah, man. All right, thanks, Baker. Um, real quick, let's drop website, Instagram, Twitters, anything like that. Black Baker on Instagram. Okay, perfect. That's easy. All right, thanks everybody for listening. Jeremy, you good back there? Sounds good. All right, catch you on the next. Thanks for listening to the Mountainside Podcast. If you haven't had a chance to do this already, please take a moment, follow, like, subscribe, or rate on whatever platform you catch the Mountainside Podcast at. Also, if you'd like some more information on upcoming episodes, safety tips, access to all of our affiliates, and all the badass discounts that we get here at the Mountainside Podcast, check out themountainsidepodcast.com. We wanted to let you know that the Mountainside Podcast is now available on Patreon. If you'd like access to bonus footage, behind-the-scenes content, ad-free listening, and much more, simply find the link in our bio or visit patreon.com forward slash the mountainside.